Hey everybody, today Rado talks through podcast episode number two. Numero zwei, numero dos, right, let's get going. So, the first one I did a month ago or so, actually I'm a little late on this, uh, so a month and about a week ago, seemed to be fairly well received by folks, so I don't really think I am going to rock the boat or change it up, so this time I'm going to be doing basically the same thing. I'll talk about the past, games that Jen and I have played over the last month, talk about the future, games that I've recently discovered that I'm super stoked about that will be coming in, out in the coming months or years in some cases, uh, see, last time I did that whole thematic talk about Dominion, and I was thinking about doing another one. I was thinking about doing Trajan, but in all honesty, I'm not really sure I'm going to have enough time because there's so many games to talk about this time. Plus, I also have a whole bunch of Q&A questions to answer. I asked for them last time. People have given them to me. So that's going to take enough time. So I don't think I'm going to do the thematic thing. But if anybody has any suggestions for games that are unfairly maligned as unthematic that you'd like me to talk about, maybe I'll revisit this in a future podcast. But this time, I think I'll just talk about games we played, games we want to play in the future, the Q&A section, and then we'll We'll end with the follow-up to the top 10 I recently did, Jen and I recently did, about engine building games. And I think that's going to take a little bit of time too because, boy howdy, well let's just say not everybody agreed with my choices for top 10. And so I think there will be a little bit to talk about there. So that's on the menu for today, so let's jump right into it, starting with the games we've recently played. And oh my gosh, June was a very, very good month. We played a bunch of stuff. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, I, I'd be here for two hours if I wanted to talk about all of it. But fortunately, I've done run-throughs for about half of the games we played. And so I'm right just now going to talk about the bigger games I think people will really be excited about. You know, some of these I might be filming in July or August. We'll see. But let's talk about them, shall we? Righty. First up, Elysium. At long last, we have finally played Elysium. I feel like uh, we are the last people in the world to have played this game because it's been around for quite a while, or several months. It's the follow-up from publisher Space Cowboys Splendor, which came out last year and was a big monster hit. Everybody loved it, except for me and Jen, apparently. We just thought it was kind of, eh, okay. We were not in love with it like everybody else. But, I gotta say, Elysium... Oh my gosh, we definitely, definitely loved it. We had such a blast playing. We only played it once, just for the first time, just a few days ago, so it's still kind of fresh in my mind, and what a hoot this game is. And actually, that's a bit of a surprise, because I was nervous going in, because I'd heard from a lot of people, including Paolo, the guy who does all my corrections, who I very much respect his opinion, a lot of people say that it's a terrible experience as a two-player game, or at the very least, it's woefully inferior. And now, to be fair, I don't know. Maybe it is woefully inferior. Maybe you want to play with four players or whatever to get the best experience. But Jen and I, we had a great time playing it as a two-player game, and it's definitely a keeper. We can't wait to play it again. So, what is it about? Just in case you're one of the few people who have not heard of Elysium from Space Cowboys. Well, let's see. Basically, it's ancient Greek mythology. All the players are demigods trying to work their way up the hierarchy to make it to the top of Mount Olympus and rub elbows with Zeus and Apollo and Hera and all the rest of it. So, we are trying to make a name for ourselves. And we do this over the course of five epochs, five rounds, while meddling in the affairs of of the mortals down on the earth. We basically, every round, or you know, all through these five rounds, we are collecting cards. And this th thematically represents us kind of starting wars and influencing important people and getting temples built and engaging in, engaging in intrigue and politics and, and all kinds of stuff that you would that seem very much in keeping with ancient Greek myth, doing all kinds of stuff. Although, that's thematically what we're doing. Basically, what we're doing is, every round, each player is going to collect four cards of the nine cards that are available that come out every round. Two of them are the same every time. They are quests. There's a, there's a, a, a really awesome quest and a very, very good quest. Although they both have strengths and weaknesses, and seven other cards that represent all these different things that can be done. And so, every round of these nine cards that come out, we are going to, between the two of us, get eight of them. And it's a race to get all the good stuff, because these cards are combo-tastic crazy. There are so many opportunities for cards to synergize 
guys and feed off of each other. And heck, sometimes, I mean, you can't even use the special power of a card unless you've got other types of cards. So it's a very, very breakneck race trying to collect the cards that are going to be perfect for your overall strategy. And so that's half of the game. And what's really interesting about that half, I mean, what's in fact so interesting, it, it was really kind of halfway through the game, I just had to stop and said, oh my God, I don't know what to do. This game is doing my head in, in a good way. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, kind of, you know, pulling my hair out with uh, not frustration, but with the sweet, sweet agony of tough, tough decisions. The, the way that comes about is the way you pay for these cards. Because each player at the beginning of the round, each player has four, well, there are literally these player pieces that look kind of like Greek pillars. And I am kind of bummed. I mean, the game overall is very, very thematic, but the they really missed a couple of tricks to be able to explain some of the stuff thematically. These four pillars seem to me to very much be the the like the four pillars of of a Greek god, like you know, nobility and vengeance and charity or whatever. But the rules never actually say what they are. They just say, hey, they are the red, green, blue, and yellow pillars. I don't remember if those were the colors, but there's four different colored pillars. I think it was. Uh, red, blue, green, and yellow, though, which is unfortunately never really great for colorblind players. But fortunately, there are unique symbols, so if you're colorblind, you can still just look at the symbols instead of the colors. So anyway, everybody has these four colors that represent you know, the four you know, tenets of godhood, I suppose. And all of the cards that are out there that you can get have different colors on them that indicate that, okay, if you want to be able to start a war, you have to have the red column on hand. You have to have the vengeance column, because you have to be a vengeful column just to take that card, which would let you start a mighty battle. But here's, a, but you know, there might be another battle card out that requires. It's it's such a big deal. It requires that you have your red pillar plus another pillar, like uh, you know, your, plus your green pillar. So you have to have your red and your green pillar to be able to take this other card. And so that's fine. Okay, at the beginning of a round, I've got all four of my pillars, so I can take pretty much anything. But once I take, say, I take that 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 particular card that says, hey, you need a, a red and a green pillar. Okay, that's cool. I had my vengeance and my, my benevolence, whatever. And so I grabbed that. Now, after you take a card, every time you take a card, you then have to jettison one of your pillars. Now, it doesn't have to be one of the ones you use to get the card. In the case of taking a, a, you know, a red card, I don't have to use... I don't have to give up my red pillar. I just have to give up one of my pillars. And so that creates, every single turn, a, a constantly deepening puzzle because, okay, well, I, I took the red card I wanted. That's great. But there's two other red cards I want. So I'm going to keep my red pillar so I can get those other red cards. But I also really want that blue card. So I better keep my red and my blue. All right. Well, that means I'll give up my green or my yellow. I guess I'll g give up this yellow. All right, fine, fair enough. And then, um, you know, and then Jen ends up taking that one blue card I wanted, and that was the only blue card I wanted. And so now, do I still have a use for this blue pillar? Now I wish I'd kept the yellow pillar because my third card, I, I, if, if I hadn't gotten rid of the yellow, I could have gone for that one. So <clears throat> you can get yourself really into a bit of a bind. You have to be very, very clever about how you spend your godly virtues to get these cards, because if you're not careful and you don't pay attention to what, you know, and you don't have a fallback plan, a backup plan, then you can get to a situation where all the cards that are left out on the table to be taken, you can't take any of them, because all the remaining ones are all yellow, and you got rid of the yellow in the very first round, and the other ones you thought you were going to get are suddenly gone. And then what are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You won't be able to take any big, cool, powerful card. Instead, you'll get stuck with a generic citizen card, which is really kind of, you know, the, um, a consolation prize, basically, because you will, every round, take four cards, or really three cards in one quest. Whether you whether you like it or not, and so if you get stuck with a uh, with a citizen, well, too bad, so sad. I mean, because they're really not going to do they're they're not going to you know help you work your way up, or will they? Because that's where the second half of this game comes in. You t this game takes place over five years, and every year we're going to be collecting these cards. You know, using these cards, you know, tapping them to activate powers and gives us special abilities. You know, gives us extra money, gives us all kinds of stuff. But at the end of every one of these years, after we've collected our stuff, we have the opportunity 
to work on writing our legend, because that's what the game is all about. To be able to make it to the upper pantheon of the gods, we have to have great and epic legends told about all the stuff we've done. And what that means is, to do that, we have to take these cards that we've collected, which we're very, very protective of. You know, They really help us a lot. They give us all kinds of special abilities. And every round, we are going to have to take some of them and transfer them to our Elysium. And now I have to admit, I don't even know what an Elysium is. That's another thematic miss from the publishers. Why didn't they? I mean, the, the game's very thematic in a lot of ways, but then there are certain key points where they don't actually explain what is an Elysium. I don't know. All I know is it's where I transfer my cards. Once I take a card that's a very powerful card, like my Warfare card that lets me you know, um, you know, get a lot of prestige on the battlefield, sooner or later, I'm going to want to stop using it for its short-term ability and transfer it to my Elysium. Because down in my Elysium, that's where I take all these cards and do set collection. I try to get all cards of the same color, or I try to get all cards of the same number. Or no, I'm sorry. Um, you, know, you try to get either of a kinds, or you try to get straights. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Of a kinds or straights um, in these little sets. And the, the bigger you can make these sets, the more points they're worth. And in fact, it's actually really interesting. At the end of the game, you know, once uh, you, know, you reveal, hey, here's all the legends I made. I, I made this uh, set of two, and I made this set of four over here. You can actually take all these cards, and they actually do create an interesting legend. There's a little story of the legend of, of my godly greatness as I did this, this, and this, and this, because I transferred all these cards over. And so that is the other sweet, sweet, agonizing decision you're constantly having to deal with with. Do I, I need to get these cards transferred, you know, you know, added to my legend? But if I do that, I'm losing the power for it. Will I be able to make up for that in future turns? Did I get a card early on that, you know what, I, I haven't actually gotten to use its special power yet because it needs to combine with something else. Do I give up on it, transfer it over to the legend? Um, because then next round, who knows, maybe the card I needed came out and I transferred it to a legend too soon. I don't really know. But the game is so full. You know, from start to finish, with all these just wonderfully agonizing decisions. I mean, we just got a big kick out of it. Just absolutely loved it. And now, what I've been told is the reason that so many people are unhappy with it as a two-player game, and in fact, there seems to be almost a cottage industry now of people coming up with two-player variants to solve this problem. In a two-player game, every round, only seven cards and two quests become available. And... That can create, or at least so I've been told, that can create situations where luck presides over everything. Because, you know, in a given round, I might go on ahead and grab a card that to get the full effect of it, it really needs to combine with some other card. And then you know what? That other card may never come out over the course of the game. Because at only seven cards coming out every round, there's just not that many cards. There's only going to be 35 cards that are ever available to us. And there's a very good chance that you know, a card might never get a spot. And so I grab this card, and then luck might screw me, and I'll never get to actually leverage it to the best of its ability. I might transfer it over to a legend, and the card I need to make it the best legend it can be might never come out, just because of the limit of cards that come out. And meanwhile, Jen, on the, first, on the first turn, she grabs some card, and then what do you know, in the second round, all the cards in the universe she needed to combo with that card came out and just fell into her lap. Because there are so few cards coming out every round, there is the danger that luck can sway the game one way or the other. And I can totally see how that might be the case. I can totally see how that's a potentially valid criticism of the two-player experience of the game. Because the more players you add, the more cards come out. The more opportunities there are for combos, the, you know, the more chances you have for fallback plans and all that stuff. In a two-player game, very few cards are ever made available to players. And so maybe that's a problem. All I can say is in the one game we've played so far, it wasn't a problem. We, you know, I was actually a bit nervous about one of my cards, you know, one of my snake cards, that I'd never actually get to activate. But by the third round, one of the cards came out, and I was able to still make good use of it. And you know, we both felt like we were able to make some really good legends at the end of the game. So while I could see that maybe that's a concern and some people are confident that the game is ruined because of it, our one play, we didn't see it at all. And I do think there are certainly some things you can do to mitigate that, even if it is a problem. One of them is one of the sets of cards. Actually, an interesting thing, before you start playing the game, there are eight godly 
pantheons, you know, Zeus and Hera and Apollo and, and Hermes and all that. And every time you play, you are going to take five of these eight gods, and that means you're going to add the cards of five of the eight gods. So every time you play, you're going to get a different big deck of cards that's going to make the game play very differently, whether there's a lot of attack cards, which Jen and I would never play. I think those are the Poseidon cards. We'll never play with Poseidon because he's just full of stealing and attacking other players. So you leave him out, that means you've got seven other gods, and you've got a lot of different combinations. One of the gods... I think it might be Apollo, adds the oracle to the game. And what that means is, in addition, in a two-player game, to the seven cards that come out every round that we're players are going to try and draft for, you also get to see four of the cards that are going to come out in the following round. And by putting that oracle in the game, which Jen and I did play with, it's like every round, I mean, there's seven that are available, but you can make a lot more decisive long-term plans because you know that, well, I already know what over half the cards in the next round are going to be, and I can see whether I have a chance of comboing this card off of some card in the future if I can manipulate things to work my way. So Jen and I, we played with the Oracle, and we thought that worked really well. In fact, I think you know the Oracle is only supposed to be added if you add Apollo. I think it's the god Apollo to the game. I think in the future, we might, this might be our variant, if in fact the concern is valid, we might add the Oracle every time we play. Even if Apollo is not part of the game, we might add the Oracle anyway, just so that we can have that advanced planning. Because we did actually find it added a lot of depth to the game. And I, I think the game wouldn't be quite as much fun without it. So anyway, that was Elysium. Our initial report, after playing it once, fantastic. I'm definitely going to want to play it a couple more times, though, before I do a run-through to see if, in fact, the two-player concern that a lot of people have, including Paolo, is valid. But anyway, that was... Oh my god, I'm at 16 minutes and I've talked about one game. Right. Let's, uh, let's pick up the pace here, buddy. Right. <clears throat> Moving on. Marco Polo, or the Voyages of Marco Polo, from the designers of... Zolk in the Mayan Calendar, which is an awesome, awesome, awesome game. And they also, last year, put out another really cool game, Dungeon Bazaar, which we enjoyed a lot. We loved Dungeon Bazaar almost. It was almost as good as Zolkin. Although, unfortunately, Dungeon Bazaar didn't really work that well as a two-player game. So, coming into Voyages of Marco Polo, I was a little bit nervous. You know, will it work as a two-player game or will it not? Because Dungeon Bazaar, while brilliant, you really need to have at least three players to make it sing. Well, I can safely say that Voyages of Marco Polo works fantastically as a two-player game. Works absolutely wonderfully. Solid game. It's interesting, though. Uh, this In the month of June, I got to play it as a two-player game with Jen and as a four-player game because I played with three other folks at Zomerspell, the convention I went to, which I did a run-through for. You can check that out. You can even see me trash-talking an 11-year-old girl in that video. Although it was all in good fun. I mean, it, 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 there was nothing harsh. Her, her dad was right there. Everybody was having a good time. It was all jokey type stuff. But anyway, um, enough about me trash-talking 11-year-old girls. More about Voyages of Marco Polo. But again, you can check the, uh, the Zomer Cell video if you want to see that. Great, great convention, by the way. Jen and I had a blast. Wonderfully put on. I strongly recommend it to anybody in or around Belgium next year. Don't miss it. Great, great convention. So, Voyages of Marco Polo. Well, it is a game all about the voyages of Marco Polo and his contemporaries trying to travel all the way from, um, you know, along the Silk Road from Italy to Beijing and, you know, fulfill contracts along the way, collect resources, uh, you know, travel, unlock special powers, use the special powers that everybody gets depending on who, which character they get at the beginning of the game. Um, really good rock solid Euro mechanisms. And the thing that drives all of it, this is a dice worker placement game where at the beginning of every Around, you roll your dice and you know you, you get values from one to six, and then the remainder of the round is using those dice to activate all the different actions of the game. You know, traveling and exploring and discovering and trading and, and contracts and all of that stuff. All the mechanisms work really great. And I think the, the most interesting thing about the game, I mean, it, this is certainly not going to usurp Zolkin as the mind blowing, oh my God, wow, they just reinvented worker placement. I mean, this game isn't that, you know, Zolkin, to be fair, is a tough, tough act to follow. I mean, that game was so revolutionary. I mean, literally, it revolves, it was revolutionary. But, you know, this is a really solid game, too. The, the, the really interesting thing it adds is the notion that it's a worker placement game, which, you know, like worker placement games, you know, there's always a race to be the first to grab whatever action on the board you want to do. But here's the thing. For most of the actions on the board, if Jen gets there first, I can still do the action. I can literally stack my dice on top of her dice. But here's the problem. 
Um, say I wanted to travel, and I, and I rolled a couple sixes, and I was going to use those to travel, and I was going to be able to go halfway across the Silk Road, and it was going to be a really big, epic turn. But before I could do it, I needed to get some money, because I, I needed some cash to be able to, to make the trip. And so the first thing I did is I used one of my other dice to get the capital I needed to, to launch this. And in the meat, because I had to do it to, to you know, optimize my travel plans, which I was going to do with these double sixes. But in the meantime, Jen goes on ahead, and she does just a, like a little quick trip from one region to another with, um, with, a, with a couple of like twos or something like that. And I'm like, oh no! Because now, I can still activate the travel as well. I will have to take my sixes and stack them on top of her twos. It's really funny, I mean, in the four-player game, we were almost, it was almost getting to become a dexterity game, because we were making like these really tall stacks of dice as multiple people use the same action in a given round. But here's the thing. Um, if I'm not first, I have to pay a fee. And the higher the dice I'm using, the more I have to pay. Because I'm using my six dice, and I, have to, I put them on somebody else, I have to pay six extra bucks to do this travel. If I'd been able to be the first to travel, I wouldn't have to pay any fee. And then if Jen were following me with her two dice, her twos, she would have to pay two bucks. So there's this really interesting thing. Higher value dice are implicitly better. There's no two ways about it. You always want to roll all sixes if you can, instead of all ones. Because they're so much more powerful. Powerful. They let you do so much more stuff. But if you're not the first player to activate a given you know, worker placement spot, suddenly those sixes become a noose around your neck because they become incredibly expensive to use. And of course, this is a worker placement game, so you're not going to be able to do everything you want all the time. And so that makes for a very, very interesting um, you know, interactive element between players where you know, it's not a mean, aggressive interaction. It's a, it's, it's a very, very cool you know, indirect interaction where you really have to pay attention to what your opponents are doing, because you'll always get to do what you want, but you might have to pay through the nose for it if you can't anticipate what you think your opponents are going to do so that you can get there first. So it's really, really sharp. And I will be honest, I, I, for my two plays so far, I will say that it was definitely much more interesting with four players than with two, because you know, um, with with th with three other players, there's going to be a lot more spaces getting filled up on the board, and so being the first to do an action is going to be tougher to do, and so you're under a lot more stress. You have to make much tougher choices with only two players. That 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 tension is still there. I mean, make no mistake, um, but it doesn't happen quite as much, and you can that you can be a little bit less concerned with what your opponent's going to do. So I mean, Jen and I, we definitely enjoy it as a two-player game. But I, de I do think it was um, you know, markedly superior as a four-player game. But unlike Dungeon Bazaar, which kind of fell apart as a two-player game, it was still a really rock-solid two-player game, and we very much enjoyed it. But um, I think we'll want to play it uh, another time or two before we can make a final decision about how strong it is a two-player game. But you know, the mechanism is rock-solid, the production stellar. I should say for Elysium, Elysium is drop-dead gorgeous, and Voyage of Marco Polo is a really great-looking game as well. So, what am I at now? 22 minutes. All right, so I only spent seven minutes on that. I'm getting faster. Game number three. Oh my gosh, this is going to take an hour just to talk about what we played. I need a drink of water. Sorry, folks. Oh, yeah, mm. No, honey, I already got a drink of water. I was smart. I got my water before I started recording this time. Oh, I am learning. I am uh, evolving as a podcaster. Okay, game number three. Spectre Ops. And um, this is another game that I feel like we're the last people in the world to play. It took us forever to get a copy over here in Europe, but we finally got it, got it to the table. I can't tell you how excited I was about playing this game. I mean, for a number of reasons. One, I was thinking, hey, finally, this is going to be a Plat Hat Games game that we actually enjoy because we've tried several other games, and while they're always wonderful, handsome productions and you know they're very well designed, I mean, they're, they never really work for us. But I was thinking this one would because, as it happens, Jen loves um, hidden movement games, which is what this is. One player in this game plays a spy, sneaking around you know, some kind of industrial complex, trying to complete objectives by hacking into the mainframe to download data or sabotage something or whatever it is. And the other player or players control security a security squad running around the complex, not knowing exactly where the spy is, but using their special powers to get some kind of like you know 
motion sensors and you know like you know being able to smell them and and uh, and and all and you know being you know being able to to see into the future because this I should I should mention right up front this is like kind of a sci-fi dystopic future world where um, you know the corporation is keeping humanity down so the spy is coming in to try to sabotage the corporation and you know, the 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 hunters are all genetically modified augmented humans who are trying to stop them so we have special powers you know like practically superpowers and so it's definitely a game of cat and mouse um, where you know I mean you could think of this as a, a, a very strong uh, candidate for Metal Gear Solid, the board game. It really captures that feel of Solid Snake sneaking around, trying to stay one step ahead. He doesn't have a cardboard box he can hide in, but he has just about every other trick. You know, smoke bombs and um, you know holographic decoys and all kinds of stuff that you know the the spy can do. And so we we played. And Jen was the spy because she never lets me be the spy. She always insists on being the spy. I always have to play the hunter. I never get to be the spy. I'm so sad about that. Um, but so you know, I was running around as a hunter. She was running around as a spy. And um, you know, the spy actually doesn't play on the board because all their movement is secret. The spy actually has a pen and paper map where they take notes and keep track of everything they're doing over the course of the adventure. And as they try to get to all their objectives and complete them and get out before they are caught by the hunters, me. And so we play the game. And uh, first of all, I have to say, it's... It's really rock solid. Once again, Plaid Hat has put out a very well designed game that just works brilliantly. Swimmingly smooth, you know, great production, you know, very, very atmospheric. You could really feel the tension is you're moving around in this shadowy complex trying to find them and, and you know and you and you know, they're you're always one step ahead of them or they're always one step behind them, one or the other. So, you know, the game works well, but at the end of it, you know, we talked about it, we're like, we were both just kind of mm, well. Yeah, it was okay. Um, and oh, I was so heart, uh, you know, crestfallen, heartbroken because I was really hoping we were going to love it. And I don't know at this point if it's the game's fault or if it's our fault. I'm leaning towards it's our fault, and I'll tell you why. I mean, actually, I should say, you know, Jen and I, we play hundreds of new games every year. We play tons and tons and tons of games. So, you know, we've gotten pretty good at this point at kind of evaluating how we respond to games and, you know, and picking them up fairly quickly and learning the strategies of them and whatnot. And, um, you know, getting a really good sense after just a game or two. But here's what happened in our game. Jen, she was sneaking around and, you know, she, it's Jen won. Let me say that right up front. I mean, Jen kind of ran away with it. At one point, I did actually get her and, you know, and, and you know, kind of had her cornered, but she got away. And the game is designed such that every time you corner the spy, you get a couple of hits on them, and then they always sneak off into the night, and then you got to resume the hunt for them. You know, that's the overall structure of the game. And the thing is, at the end of the game, I asked Jen, so, did you ever feel any tension? Did you ever feel any pressure? Were you, was, the, was the noose tight around your neck? Did my dragnet you know, make you, were you always worried? She said, nah, you know what, you were never very close. I was always able to sneak by you. Um, you never really created a threat, and I was just kind of going through the motions, I'm like ah. So that's why Jen didn't have much fun. And so it's on me, folks. I failed miserably as the hunter. I did not play a very good game. And you know, I realized about maybe two thirds of the way through the game why I was doing so poorly. It's because I was actually, I was. I was being too proactive and not reactive. Or no, I was playing offensively instead of defensively. The game gives the hunters all kinds of you know, cool tools that give you a rough idea of where the spy is. So you can kind of keep track of their movements. And whenever I would use one of those tools to find out, right, at this point, she's over in that area, I would just, you know, you know, hell bent for leather, run off in that direction and try to catch them. But every time I would do that, Jen would just slip through my fingers. I needed to not be always trying to go to where she is at that moment, but instead try to anticipate where she's going and head off in that direction to cut her off at the pass and make things more difficult for her. That's really the key to success. And I realized it a little bit too late. I was being too aggressive, not defensive enough. So we definitely need to play this game again. And I really hope that I can convince Jen to let me be the spy just once, just once. We had Fury of Dracula for years, played it several times. I never once got to be Dracula. I'm hoping just once I'll get to be the sneaky person. And we'll, and we'll see. I mean, because I definitely think, you know, the jury's still out. Um, I, I think we, I've, I've learned my lesson. I think I'll be a better hunter in the future. And so we'll have to revisit this again when we uh, come back to Specter Ops. Okay, uh, next up. 
Wow. You know what? Okay, I'm at a half an hour. I can't afford, I can't even talk about all the stuff I was gonna talk about. Let's see, okay. No, no. All right, um, I, last thing, uh, Tasty Minstrel Games uh, sent me four games, sent us four games this month to check out. None of them are out yet. They are all, I guess, from their new line of little tiny box games. They've been doing like Harbor and whatnot. And so I'll just mention all of them. Flip City, Cthulhu Realms, Dungeon of Fortune, and uh, what's the other one? Oh, Bottle Cap Vikings. Let's just talk about those four little ones because they're all smaller games. So hopefully, I'll be able to get these, get through these in a relatively reasonable time frame. Don't worry about the games I'm not talking about. I'll eventually do run-throughs for all of this stuff. Eventually, don't worry, folks. But anyway, let's just talk about those four games. And I think it'll be good to talk about them because I think most of these are going to be coming out at Gen Con, and I don't know if I'll have time to do run-throughs for them in case people are curious. Although, speaking of that. My next podcast, I'm going to try, my podcast number three, I am going to try to ensure that I put it up like four or five days before Gen Con. And the big topic of podcast number three will be my Gen Con preview, where I talk about all the games that I wish I could be there to either play or buy. So you can look forward to that in podcast number three. But anyway, back to games we recently played. Let's, what do I want to do first? Let's do Cthulhu Realms first. Which is interesting. Cthulhu Realms is a, uh, a deck builder that is running off the same gameplay system as Star Realms, which, along with Splendor, was the other really big monster surprise hit of last year. I mean, uh, Star Realms is just huge, huge, huge. Everybody's playing it. Jen, I, I have to admit, we've not played it. That's not entirely true. I did actually play the digital version of it. I downloaded that because you can download it for free on pretty much every platform, iOS and Windows and Mac, and I think there's an Android version of it as well. So this is not a hard game to play if you want to, just to see what Star Realms is like. And I had downloaded it, and I thought... Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. It's, 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 it's a nice little deck builder. But I, I, I didn't really fall in love with it. Certainly not enough to ever seek Star Realms out. It seemed kind of by the numbers. The interesting thing, um, what Star Realms, and by association Cthulhu Realms is, is a dueling deck builder, where the whole thing is about building your deck up as fast as you can, filling it up with powerful cards, You know, doing the standard Dominion style, hey, a certain number of cards you can use in your hand every turn, can buy other cards that go into your discard pile, and then eventually you reshuffle your card, and then later on, at some point, you get to use those cards. And in both of these games, all the cards you're buying are variations of attacking your opponent to try to do 50 points of damage to them, because the first player to kill the other player wins. And the fundamental thing that it really adds... I wouldn't say this. It adds it to the the deck builder format popularized by Dominions, but it just kind of like focuses like a laser on combo chains. Specifically, you know, pretty much every deck builder that's worth its salt at all is sure to include cards that can combo well. So if you get like this card and this card and this card in your deck, and then you can run your deck enough such that you can get all three of these cards out in your hand at once, oh my god, that's going to be an awesome turn. It's going to make you a bajillion points. And so a big part of deck building is, you know, Filling up your deck with good stuff that will work well and synergize with each other. What both Star Realms and Cthulhu Realms do to really accentuate that is the uh, the all the cards you can buy come in suits. In Star Realms, there's four different suits, which are basically colors. I forget what they are, purple and red and green or whatever. Um, and in Cthulhu Realms, there's only three suits. And... These cards are designed that, you know, if you get a yellow card, it's very likely that you want to get more yellow cards. Because the more yellow cards, specifically, you get in your deck, the more they're going to combo and chain off each other, and the more interesting side effects you're going to get. So, unlike Dominion, where sometimes the combos are really kind of subtle... And you really have to go digging for them and find them. In these games, it makes it very, very easy to make incredibly powerful and satisfying combo chains because they just wear it on its sleeve, saying, hey, you know what? You just want to make sure you get a lot of yellow cards because you'll make some, you'll make a really strong deck that way. So um, it works, and it works very well. And you know, I found playing, well, I found playing Star Realms in the in the digital app. Um, you know, the digital app does everything for you. You don't get the actual tactile enjoyment of playing the cards. It's like, oh, I get to draw two more cards. Let me draw them and see what they are. You know, since it automates everything for you, it becomes just kind of like a very dry, rote, repetitive action that's just not very exciting. I, I didn't really enjoy it very much. But um, I can say... Well, okay, enough talking about Star Realms. So, 
or actually, other than to say what the story of Star Realms or, or the story of Star Realms versus Cthulhu Realms is, because I'm really kind of off in the weeds now. But Cthulhu Realms is the game I've actually played. It is from Tasty Minstrel Games. It is from the same designer as Star Realms. But the story is that Michael Mendez, the you know the head honcho, the grand poobah of Tasty Minstrel Games, got a copy of Star Realms early on played it, thought it was very cool, but there were certain things he didn't like about it. And um, while he's really not a designer himself, he's mostly focuses on publishing, um, you know, he started just tinkering with the game. Like one of the things he did, I already mentioned is, Star Realms has four different suits, um, and Michael said, you know what, let's reduce that to three suits, because if there's only three colors in the game, that's going to up your chances of getting more combo chains. He also changed the composition of your starting hand. Uh, in Star Realms, you basically get just a bunch of really schlubby cards, but Michael changed it so that you get more powerful cards in your starting hands, so you can kickstart your purchasing power that much earlier. And you know there were a bunch of little tweaks here and there. And um, you know he started working on it, and he contacted the designer of Star Realms. Star th that guy. Um, I'm sorry, I really should have looked up his name. I'll start trying to look up his name now. Uh, that guy was actually quite intrigued, and so he and Michael started Darwin Castle. Uh, started working together, or was it uh, Rob uh, Doherty? I'm not really quite sure. Maybe he contacted both of them. Um, I'm sure all this will come out. So take this is all hearsay. But basically, Michael contacted the designers, said, "Hey, um, you know, this is what, what this is what I'm playing with your game. What do you think?" And they liked it, and they started riffing, and one thing led to another, and next thing you know, Tasty Minstrel Games has got have, buys the licensing rights for the Star Realms engine from White Wizard Games, the publisher of the original game, and puts out a new re-themed of it based on Cthulhu Missos instead of Outer Space um, Starship Battles. And, you know, it's, it's, so it's from the same designer, or it's for, uh, specifically from Darwin, um, although really I think Michael deserves kind of like a... Uh, a, a credit for co-design on that because you know he really initiated a lot of this stuff and I, my understanding is anyway a lot of the ideas were his but I'm sure Darwin actually made all his ideas work and stuff like that so we now I don't know why I went through all that um, because it really is neither here nor there just how is the game well Jen and I played it and I was very surprised to find we enjoyed it very much uh, it was very very cool very very satisfying from my experience, to try and compare and contrast the two games, I think the main thing it does, like, well, like I said, Cthulhu Realms really speeds the game up. There are fewer suits. You, you basically have more purchasing power right from the get-go. So the game escalates much, much quicker. You still do the same basic stuff. Instead of building space stations that will protect you and give you special powers, in this game you um, set up locations like um, you know old haunted mansions or you know creepy universities and stuff like that that will give you special powers. And instead of you know building you know big squadrons of space ships that will fight on your behalf, you instead conjure ancient, you know, Cthulhu mythos beasts like Yigos and stuff, or Migos and stuff like that, who will fight on your behalf. So, you know, it's, it's a one-for-one -one transfer, but the interesting thing about it is the... The, even though this is a, you know, Cthulhu Mythos is a dark and scary and creepy and foreboding thing, all about people going insane and the end of the world and death cults and all that stuff, this game, the art in it is incredibly lovely and cute and charming and just delightful to look at. This game definitely has its tongue firmly planted in cheek. I mean, there are some cards that are literally laugh out loud funny. It is not taking itself seriously. It is definitely a wink and a nod for Cthulhu fans. And I'm sure some Cthulhu fans will be very put off by that because, hey, we take our end of the world death cults very seriously. Whereas this game is just clearly having a good time with it. But Jen, I gotta say, we enjoyed it so much. I think we definitely... Um, found the theme of this much more interesting than just generic outer space starships battling each other. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Star Realms has very, very nice art as well, but it's just kind of very by the numbers. Whereas, you know, I mean, every time you get a new card um, in Cthulhu Realms, you want to stop and study the art because there's just it's just so lovely and funny, and there's all kinds of wonderful little details, and every picture tells a very interesting story. Um, you know, and it's also full of really cool little inside jokes for fans of Cthulhu. So the presentation is stellar, just knocks it out of the park, and that makes it so much fun. And then in terms of gameplay, the thing I found is there compared to my limited plays of Star Realms, there is a lot more interesting 
combo change you can do. Yes, the whole thing is still driven by, hey, make sure you get a lot of yellow cards, or make sure you get a lot of purple cards, because you know they're going to chain well. But a lot of these cards have several abilities, and you can play the abilities in any order you want. And sometimes the puzzle of what um, unfolds in your hand of cards is, well, okay, well, if I, play, if, I, if, I, if I play this card and use this ability, that will unlock this ability over here, but I also on this card want to trash this card, so I can unlock this other ability. So I have to play this card first and this card first, but before I play either, I really need to get this one so that that one when I play can get the double. And so, but um, if I play this card first, I have to trash it immediately, which means I won't be able to use the. I mean, so you, you get lots more interesting, convoluted in a good way combinations of cards in your hands. Uh, Star Realms, I think, from what I've played, and I have very limited experience, is much more straightforward. Hey, if you get these two cards, um, it lets you draw extra cards. Or, hey, if you get this card, it lets you do extra damage. In Cthulhu Realms, the combinations are much more interesting and um, oh, emergent. You know, and it really feels like you're in a lot more control. In Star Realms, most of the interesting decision making is really just about what cards you buy. In Cthulhu Realms, there's still, you know, that, that's a still very interesting decision making, but then there's equally interesting decision making of how do you play this hand of cards you have now dealt yourself. And so, I mean, on the whole, I gotta say, from my limited plays of both, Cthulhu Realms is definitely tops over Star Realms. Although, to be fair, Star Realms has some very, very big advantages. I'm still, actually, now that we found we enjoy Cthulhu Realms so much, I'm probably going to try and seek out Star Realms, because the number one thing Star Realms does is it has a bunch of expansions. It's been hugely popular, and it allows for co-op play, which Cthulhu Realms obviously does not do. And so, that might be enough to sway us over to the Star Realms, even though I think, on the whole, Cthulhu Realms, which is an evolution of the system, it's not surprising that as an evolution of the system, it has become an interesting and more deep system to play with. But it isn't co-op, and Star Realms has the option for co-op. Although, on the flip side, Cthulhu Realms, out of the box, supports four players, whereas Star Realms does not. And you have to buy multiple copies of Star Realms to be able to play four players. So, I mean, there's definitely pros and cons for both. I mean, I really think, probably more than anything else, you should really be driven by what theme you find more enjoyable, or whether you want co-op or just straight competitive. But I think just in terms of just evaluating the two, sy the, the two games as how they leverage the core design, I think Cthulhu Realms is a very worthy um, successor to Star Realms. And I, so that was the first of the Tasty Minstrel minigames we played. Let's continue on to Flip City, which is another deck builder. And this is actually an import from Japan. In Japan, it's called Design Town. But when Tasty Minstrel brought it over, or they're about to bring it over, I, I, I don't think it's out yet, but it will be out maybe in time for Gen Con. I'm not really quite sure. But anyway, um, it's been turned to Flip City, and while I have to admit I'm not hugely a big fan of either of those names, I do think Flip City is the better name, because once you start playing the game and you see just how often you flip these cards, you, you kind of are left wondering, well, I don't know what else you could call it. I mean, of course it's Flip City. I'm flipping this city all the time. So what is it? Well, it's interesting. The game proudly proclaims itself a micro deck builder, which is interesting in and of itself. Because, of course, you know, a deck builder, you, you expect there's going to be the game's going to have tons and tons and tons of cards. But, um, to be fair, Flip City doesn't come with very many. But, but the way that they have uh, solved that problem of, okay, how can we make a big, rich, robust deck builder with lots of options, even though the game doesn't come with very many cards? Simple. Make every card two sided. Uh, and, you know, and it's just brilliant. And instead of buying a new card to add to your deck, you can flip cards that are already in your deck to effectively get new buildings. You could have a residence in your deck, which does a certain amount of something, but you can flip it, i.e., upgrade it, to turn it into an apartment block, which makes it much better. You can have a hospital in your deck, but you can flip it to turn it into, well, basically, um, it's a hospital with a church added on. So, as a hospital, it takes care of the people's physical needs, but then if you add the church on top of it, it takes care of their spiritual needs, so it becomes even more powerful. And so every building you can add to your deck that represents your city, your flip city, every one of these cards can be flipped to become more powerful. And when they become more powerful, they um, not only do they, do they do better stuff for you, but on a lot of them, you have the option to downgrade them, or recycle them, the game calls it, to flip them back over to get a one-time special bonus. And so you know, the, the, you know, the church, you know, or the, the shopping mall downgrades back to a convenience store, and then later on you can upgrade it back to a shopping mall. So it's a really interesting twist in that 
You know, not only are you worried about what cards you're actually playing, but all the cards in your discard pile every round, you well, basically every round, like a regular deck builder, you have the opportunity to buy one card that's out on the public display and add to your deck. But instead of buying a card, you can use that money to flip a card that's in your discard pile. And so you don't add cards to your deck, you just upgrade the cards that are in your deck. And that's a very interesting choice you get to make quite a bit. Now, the other thing... That, you know, all that's really cool, and I think that's very, very clever, but that's nothing compared to the other element that this adds to the core deck builder um, uh, you know, genre, and that is push your luck. Because here's the interesting thing you can, because all the cards are two sided, when you're looking at your draw pile, you can see what you're about to draw. There's no secrets there. So you don't, at the beginning of every turn, you don't draw your five cards and then see what you're going to play and all that stuff. No, no, no. You draw and play cards one at a time. At the beginning of your turn, you're looking at your deck and you can see, oh yeah, at the top of my deck is a convenience store. I bought that a little while ago. I'll play this convenience store because, hooray, it gives me some money that I'll be able to use to buy something. And then that reveals the next card on your deck. And you have to choose. Well, you know what? Oh, um, it's an apartment block. Okay, I'll play that one too because it gives me some more money. So now I'm getting enough money that I could maybe afford to buy that factory that I've got my eye on. Or I could upgrade the factory I've already got into... Well, I forget what the factory upgrades do. I could upgrade that hospital I've already got into the uh, church. So, you know, I'm starting to get enough money. But then, I, when I reveal my third card... It's a residence card. And residence cards, which are kind of like, you know, all deck builders, you always start out with a bunch of cards in your deck that you don't like, that are crappy, that are terrible. All the residence cards are the bad cards in this game. Because whenever you reveal a residence card, you have to play it. You have no choice. And the problem with residence cards is they are all full of frowny face icons. And during a round, if you ever get, or during your turn, if you ever get three frowny faces into play, you bust and your entire turn is over and you achieve nothing. So every time, you know, you, you, hey, I did the convenience card and, oh, there's my factory. I want to play that. But as you play more and more cards, there's a greater and greater danger of busting because as soon as you reveal one of those residences, that could be the thing that pushes you over the top. So you really have to pay attention. Right, how many residences are in my discard pile? How many might I still draw? Okay, the next card I draw, it's going to be a, there's a one in three chance it's going to be a residence. And if I draw and I get that residence, I'm going to bust. And I'm not going to be able to buy anything. Should I stop now or should I draw one more? Because if I draw this one, I'll have enough money to buy the really big thing I want that's going to be awesome. And that, be, that can, over the course of the game, become a very interesting decision to make. Um, and so, this really tense push-your-luck element, in addition to the flipping of cards to upgrade and downgrade your cards, makes Flip City a very fresh, interesting take on deck builders. It doesn't feel like anything else out there. And now it's interesting. How did we like it, you, you might ask? We, we actually played it twice. And I actually played it a couple more times first as a solo game, because the game comes with solo rules. And right off the bat, I will say, I really enjoyed it as a solo game. It was really a lot of fun. And I was having a great time. So I was really excited to get to the table. Thought we were going to have a great time playing it together. And then we found, oh, oh, oh. And we were a bit disappointed because this is a mean game as well. This is a very cutthroat game. When you're playing solo, you're not playing against anybody. So there's really no bad stuff you can do to anybody else. But remember how I was talking about those residence cards? You want, you know, th those are the cards that will kill you because they force, when, when they appear at the top of your deck, it's kind of representing the citizens of your town demanding help, demanding, um, you know, support from the government. And, you, and you know, the more of those you get, the more it'll weigh you down and you'll eventually bust on a given turn if there's too many demands from the citizens. So what you want to do is you want to upgrade those residences to apartment blocks. And then the apartment blocks still create those frowny faces, but you're not forced to draw them because, strictly speaking, they're in an apartment block. Hey, you know what? There's an apartment manager who can take care of it. You're not forced to draw them. But here's the thing. Apartment blocks, once you have those in your deck and you're getting rid of all the residences that can really screw you over with the push-your-luck stuff, you have the opportunity to upgrade an apartment block as well. And what that does is, if you upgrade your apartment blocks, which is very expensive, you get to send them over to your opponent and they get turned back to residences. So, and you know that's what Jen and I found. I mean, there are, and it's not just the um, residence uh, apartment block. There are some other cards that let you basically really choke your opponent and drown them in um, basically red tape that can really slow them down. And you know because there are so few cards in this game, um, because it's a micro game, 
You know, in, in Dominion, Dominion has some cards. It has some cursed cards and stuff like that. And yeah, you can you know screw players a little bit. But even if you're going to play with those cards, it, it's it's really not that debilitating in this game because there are so few cards. And it's such this game is a race. The first player to get, I think it's eight stars on a given turn, if I recall correctly. First player to do that wins. And stars are on some of your cards, so you're trying to get the cards that give you more stars. But you're also trying to get the cards that give you more money, so you can buy more cards that give you more stars. All that kind of stuff. So it's a race to get to. I believe it was eight stars. But there are so many opportunities to really clog up your opponent's deck, significantly clog them up, that Jen and I, you know, we were really kind of disheartened because you, know, you kind of have to do it. When you have the opportunity, if you don't take that opportunity, you're really hurting yourself because you're not playing an optimal game anymore. So while I, you know what, it might almost be keepable because it's so much fun. It's a wonderful, wonderful puzzle. We really enjoyed it as a solo game. But as soon as we start playing with other players, and you know, we could just really start beating each other over the head, and it's just like it's it it felt almost nonstop. It really started to hamper our enjoyment of the game quite a bit. And so that's really kind of so again, it was kind of a mixed response. Obviously, if you enjoy attacking other players and really kind of screwing with their plans, it's definitely something worth thinking out. If you enjoy a really interesting solitaire puzzle, it might be something you want to uh, seek out. If you're a really crazy Care Bears like us, you know, you might want to look into it a little bit before you, you know, try before you buy kind of thing. Um, I think I will be doing a run-through of this before too long, though. I mean, hopefully I'll get a run-through of all of these things, you know, in the next month or so, but we'll see. But that was Flip City. Continuing on, let's go to Dungeon, or Dungeon of Fortune. Which is interesting. A Dungeon of Fortune is actually a re-implement, or you know, it's a, it's set in the same universe as Dungeon Roll. And since I've never, t- I've never done a run through for Dungeon Roll, I've never, I didn't talk about it. Um, I did actually talk about it in my top ten fillers. Dungeon Roll made my top ten fillers, and I stand by that. Dungeon Roll is a lovely little filler game. And I guess before I talk about Dungeon of Fortune, which I guess is the the sequel to Dungeon Roll, I should talk about Dungeon Roll a little bit. That is a kind of push your luck card or dice game where you have a bunch of dice that represent the members of your adventuring party um, who are trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper into a dungeon to find more and more treasure to score points. And um, there, so every round before you go into the dungeon, you roll your dice to see who your party is going to be. And then as you go deeper into the dungeon, you start rolling dungeon dice to see what they're going to face. You, on the first level, you roll one die, and maybe it's like a single skeleton or a single slime, or maybe it's a treasure chest or, whatever, or a, a magic scroll or a potion or whatever it might be. And then you deal with whatever it is. You go to the second level of the dungeon, you roll two dungeon dice. And now maybe it's a slime and a skeleton or it's two skeletons. And then you go to the third level and then you roll three dungeon dice. And the deeper you go, the more enemies dice you have to roll. And whenever you deal with these enemy dice, you're using up your own personal hero dice. And so there comes a point where you realize, you know what, if I try to go to the next level, I probably won't have enough dice to deal with these problems. I better get out now, because if you ever get to a level where you cannot defeat all the monsters, you lose everything. All your progress is lost. So it's a push your luck game. But the interesting thing about dungeon roll is, it's Push your luck is there. That's definitely an element. But I think a lot of people mistakenly think the game is all about push your luck. But it's not really. Dungeon Roll is a surprisingly tricksy game all about coming up with really interesting combos. Because in that game, you get your own special power as the leader of the expedition. And as you're opening treasure chests, you're unlocking, you're getting all kinds of magical treasures that give you special abilities as well. And you always want to go as deep as you can to score as many points as possible. And um, you know, to do that, you often have to use the treasures you found to allow you to deal with whatever. And every time you give up a treasure, you're losing a point. And so if you give up a treasure to be able to go to a deeper level, you've lost a point to gain a point. It's really not that big a deal. But if you can come up with really interesting combinations that let you kind of do the unthinkable and beat these unstoppable monsters, you can push and deeper and deeper and deeper into dungeons. It's less about pushing your luck and more about knowing what you're capable of doing and, you know, you know, with a little bit of luck, trying to get as deep as possible. It's a really sharp game. Very fun, very fast, and I enjoyed it a lot. So, with that out of the way, let's talk about its sequel, Dungeon of Fortune, which is um, where Dungeon Roll is a dungeon delving dice game. Now they've taken the same basic setting, but made it a card game instead. And the interesting thing is, they have really pushed the, what do you call it, the, the push your luck to an 11. Where Dungeon Roll, push your luck is there, but it's not really the focus of the game. In Dungeon of Fortune, it is totally the focus of the game. Once again, you are a brave uh, adventurer leading a band of adventurers going deeper and deeper and deeper into a dungeon. And you want to go as deep as you can, because, um, but 
if you go too far and you can't deal with the with the dangers, you'll lose all your progress and you'll have to start over next round. So, you know, the, the core structure is the same. Instead of rolling dice every time as you go deeper, you know, further and further into the dungeon to see what you come up with, you instead draw cards. And the cards tell you, hey, you know, on, the, on this level, this is what you get. On this level, this is what you get. So, you know, the, the core is still there. You still have the same followers, the clerics and the wizards and the fighters and the champions and the thieves. You still find treasure chests and scrolls and um, the, the different types of monsters to beat. So there's a lot of the same stuff. But there's one core thing that has been added, or I should say changed, other than turning dice into cards. In Dungeon Roll... When it comes around to my turn, my entire turn is devoted to me going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the dungeon. And everybody else who's playing, they just have to watch as I just you know keep pushing my luck and taking my chances and using my special powers, and everybody else is just on hold waiting until it's their turn to explore a dungeon. I have to say, it is a marked improvement in Dungeon of Fortune that nobody waits. Everybody goes to the dungeon at the same time. And this is actually almost a game that everybody can almost play simultaneously. Okay, everybody, explore level 1 of your dungeon. And now everybody, explore level 2 of your dungeon. And everybody, explore level 3 of your dungeon. Oh, wait a minute. Betty, do you are you worried you're not going to make level 4? Okay, Betty's bowing out. Okay, now everybody except for Betty, go to level 4. Oh, Bob, do you think you're going out? Okay, now Bill is alone, and he's made it to level 5. So... Everybody's more involved every round because you're not waiting for somebody to be done. But the interesting thing is, the push your luck just goes through the roof because the last person to bug out, the person who can stay in the dungeon the longest, gets a huge treasure benefit. I forget what it is. I think it was like two treasures, which in this game is gigantic. It's a really big deal. Or was it two gold? But whatever, I forget exactly what it was, but it was a big enough deal that while normally you you know it'd be very risky for you to go any deeper you don't want to go any deeper now you are tempted to push your luck all the more because you know if you don't you are giving a big benefit to your opponent who you're pretty confident is going to go. So you have to spend a lot more time focusing on, right, okay, well, if I go, and if they go, are they going to make it? Are, are they going to not go? Am I going to go? Now, I should say, I said simultaneous. It's not really simultaneous. Everybody does go in order. So whoever is first is at a real disadvantage. You want to be the last player in this game because... <clears throat> That means you get to wait to see if everybody else goes or if everybody else bugs out. Because then if you're the last person to bug out, you get to go. But here's the thing. If you're the person who was the last person to bug out, and therefore you got the big reward, that means you become the first player next round. And suddenly you have the big disadvantage. And it becomes very, very difficult to stay in the dungeon the longest. So it's a lovely structure. Absolutely adore it. It works so well, and it is so smart. You know, I almost wish it could be retrofitted back into Dungeon Roll, but unfortunately, Dungeon Roll doesn't come with enough dice so that multiple playable people can be playing at the same time. I wonder if you got multiple copies of Dungeon Roll if you could rework this structure. Because it's interesting. While I love these improvements, I love the extra attention to push your luck, I love the fact that everybody is engaged in the dungeon as opposed to just one person and everybody else is watching. I think those are huge improvements. But at the end of the day, Dungeon of Fortune is still a much simpler game. There are combos you can do, but the combos and whatnot are nowhere near as deep and intricate and rich as what's in Dungeon Roll. So I still think Dungeon Roll has a lot more interesting puzzles to solve every round. Whereas Dungeon of Fortune is a much more simple, straightforward, do I push my luck and do I make it one step further? I mean, the puzzle of Dungeon of Fortune is less about will I be, you know, will I be able to handle the dungeon, yes or no, but more will I be, am I more likely to be able to handle the dungeon than everybody else? So should I push my luck or not? And so that makes it, it's a subtle change, but it's a significant change. And um, honestly, we enjoyed it quite a bit. We still enjoy Dungeon Roll. It's, it's funny, I think. They're both good enough to both be keepers for us. Anyway. Oh, no, no. One more. One more. Yes. I've got one more game now. At 57 minutes. Oh, my gosh. And I only have four minutes left on my battery. Oh, dear. How exciting. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So, last one. <laughs> um, Bottle Cap Vikings. This game, I think, is definitely going to go on Jen's and my top 10 restaurant games list because it is so tiny. The name Bottle Cap comes from the fact that at the center of the table, the board is a a uh, chit that is not much bigger than a bottle cap. And around this bottle cap, you build a rondelle, which is a series of spokes that have different special powers on every one of those spokes. 
And, oh, you know what? Okay, I'm going to have to get up and plug this in because I'm probably going to have to talk a little bit more about Bottle Cap Viking. So let's move on over here. We are a portable podcast. Let's see. Oh, where are you, power cord? Where are you? Why do I talk so much? I can't find the power cord. There it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> la, la, la. Will I edit this out later? No, I won't because I'm too lazy. Okay, let's sit back down. Righty, bottle cap Viking. So now I can talk at my leisure. I've got all the juice in the world. Righty, Roo. So bottle cap Vikings, we are all a bunch of Vikings. This is another race game. I gotta say, Jen and I, we really do enjoy race games because it means the it's less about you know trying to destroy somebody else and more about just trying to reach your goal before everybody else. And that just, in general, we find so much more pleasant in game design. Yay! No player elimination. So, this race game, there's uh, two ways you can win. You can be the first to get, I, it was either 10 or 12 glory points. I forget what the, I think it was 10. Or you can be the first to work all the way up your tech tree, your, your own little Viking civilization, to work to the top of your tech tree. The first player to do that or get 10 points wins the game. So everybody's racing to do that. And there's, a, there's several really interesting things about this game. Really, really fun elements. First of all, I mentioned everybody has a tech tree. They're trying to race up. And as you're going up the tech tree, you're getting new special powers that you know change the rules. But you can only have one special power at a time. So... You often have a situation where, okay, I want to keep on going up the tech tree. I've got enough money now to go to the next level. But if I go to the next level, I'll lose the power I've got right now. And the power I've got right now is really awesome. And the power I'll get on the next level is not as interesting for my situation. Should I stay at this level a little bit longer to leverage its power a little bit more? Or should I move up? It's a race. That's a tough choice. And the fact is everybody has a unique tech tree. My tech tree is full of powers that are different than your tech tree. So that's very, very cool as well. You know, a lot of built-in replayability right there as you, you know, have different tech trees going up against different tech trees. That's really awesome. But that's only half of it. Because what really adds to the replayability of this game, the core central conceit of this is it's a rondelle game. Which, I don't know, I, I can't show it to you because this is a podcast, but in case you don't know what a rondelle-based game is, like... Like, what's a Rondell game? Uh, Navigador, or Antique, or Shipyard. I mean, there's lots of Rondell games out there. A Rondell game is a game where the, the board is a circle, is a wheel with spokes. And each one of those spokes is an action space that if you go to a spoke on this wheel, it lets you do something. In Bottle Cap Vikings, there's a lot of different actions like collect resources, convert resources into other resources, you know, change the parameters of your ship, you know, repair your ship, all kinds of stuff. Um, you'll know, upgrade your, your technology on your tech tree. So various and sundry things that are on this this um, wheel. And on your turn, what you do is, everybody has their own little Viking ship. And, you know, the Viking ship is somewhere on this wheel. And you pick it up, and you can move one, two, or three spaces clockwise around the wheel. So, a rondelle game, by definition, is one where you're very, very limited in what you can do. At any given time, you always have, you're on your turn, you get three actions. The, the, the first, the second, or third action in a clockwise direction from where you are on the rondelle. And so, the game is often a mix of short-term and long-term planning. Okay, well, because I know if I move forward two, I'll get to do this action, and then on my next turn, I can move forward three. So that means over two turns, I'll have moved five spaces. But if I want to get to that fifth space, I really should only move one this turn so I can get this, this other benefits, so they'll be really good when I get to five spaces. But that means it's going to take me three turns instead of two to get to that space, five spaces away. So how are you going to best you know, use your number one resource in the game, which is time, the time it takes to go around this rondelle? So, rondelle games are great. I mean, we generally tend to really, really enjoy them. They're just a good, fun, solid gameplay mechanism. And here's what's cool about Bottle Cap Vikings. Every time you set up the game, you make a new, different rondelle. Because the rondelle is not just written in stone, like pretty much every other rondelle game I've ever seen. It is a modular rondelle, where, as part of random setup, you put all these different pieces around it, which means, uh, in some games, the rondelle might be really, really good at generating lumber. And in other games, it might be really good at generating wood. Or it might be, you know, I mean, you, you never really know exactly what this rondelle is going to be giving you. It's going to be different every time. So that, plus the fact that every time you play, you're going to have a different tech tree, makes for some huge replayability. And now the game itself, once you start playing, is really dead simple. Because, you know, it's interesting. This is... 
Most of the time, when you when you have a Rondell based game, the Rondell is kind of like the central driving component that lets you do a bunch of stuff. But there's always other things. There's some economic game, or there's some exploration game, or there's something else you're doing. And the Rondell is just the means that you use to drive all your actions throughout the game. In this game, the Rondell is everything. Um, the game is very pure, and it's just really stripped back to the core. I'm actually reminded of another Tasty Minstrel game, which I haven't done a run through for, Harbor. Harbor is basically a worker placement game stripped down to its bare essence. Because it's a worker placement game where you have one worker. And all you do every turn is you just put your worker on one space and do whatever it says. And then your next turn, you move your worker to a different space and do what it says. And all you're doing in that game is collecting resources and selling them on a marketplace to convert them into other buildings that, that create new places for your worker to go. It's a really simple self-contained system that's tiny and portable and, again, just pure in the clarity of its purpose. The, Bottle Cap Vikings is the same thing for rondelles because your entire focus is traveling around this rondelle trying to collect one of three resources. Lumber, gold, and glory points. Gold and glory points you need. Glory points can win you the game if you get enough glory points. But gold plus glory points are what's needed to be able to climb up your tech tree. Lumber, on the other hand, is needed to repair your Viking ship. Because as you're moving, every time you make a full 360 degree trip around this rondelle, your Viking ship will take damage. No doubt because it goes through some kind of stormy seas. So over time, your ship is getting more and more damaged. Um, also, if at any point somebody lands in the same spoke on the rondelle as you, once again, you and your opponent will take damage. And so, you know, sometimes you know, that's unavoidable because I happen to be a place where somebody else desperately wants to go. So they're going to come here and we're both going to take some damage. So over the course of this game, you're collecting... And sometimes, on a lot of the rondelle spokes, you know, I could take a little bit of lumber, but if I purposely allow myself to take some damage, I could take a lot of lumber. So a lot of times, you're voluntarily, voluntarily taking damage to your ship. So your ship is getting beat up a lot. And that's why you need to collect lumber, because there are certain spots on the rondelle where you can go to use that lumber to repair your ship, which you know, makes perfect thematic sense. And so, your focus is always on trying to, well, should I be getting more lumber? Should I be getting more gold? Should I be getting more glory? You know, wh what is going to be the best trip for me around this rondelle? And at all times, you're also focusing on, well, you know what? If I land over here, I'm going to take some damage. But if I land over, you know, if I land over here, somebody's likely to land where I am and, and make me take some damage. But there's another interesting thing about this damage game. You could take all the damage in the world. Every time you take damage, you draw um, a random damage chip. And the, most of the chits are just really kind of inconsequential. They don't mean anything. But a few of the chits, in a two-player game, five of the chits that you could draw have a Valkyrie on them, a red Valkyrie. And so if, you, if you're drawing chits and you know, there's no Valkyries, no big deal. Um, we can weather. We don't have to worry about repairing ourselves. But between all the players, once all the... And this is in a two-player game. With more players, there's more red Valkyries you have to draw. But in a two-player game, once combined, you've drawn five Valkyries, the Valkyries come. And at that point, all the damage you've let accrue will bite you in the butt. Because the more damage chits you have when the Valkyries come, the more resources you lose. And you can lose a lot of stuff. You could lose victory points, you could lose gold. I mean, you could lose just, just about everything if you're not careful. And that creates interesting circumstances as well. Because there might be a case where Jen has a lot of damage. And I don't have very much. I, heck, I don't even have any damage because I've recently repaired myself. And Jen's got a bunch of damage. And I can see that four of Jen's damages are Valkyries. If one more Valkyrie comes out, then um, you know, I won't take any. I won't have any losses. I don't have any damage. And Jen, she has a lot. And so now Jen's in a bit of a pickle because if one more Valkyrie comes out, she'll suffer a setback and I won't. So she needs to get repaired first. But here's the thing: if you want to play aggressively. I might go out of my way to forcibly damage my own ship in the hopes that I will draw that last Valkyrie. Because if the Valkyries come and I've only got one damage chip, but my opponent has like four damage chips, they will suffer a huge setback and I will suffer very little setback at all. In fact, I think if I only have one damage chip, I don't suffer anything. So that can become a very, very interesting interactive element to the game. 
if you want to play that way. That's one of the brilliant things about Bottle Cap Vikings. You don't have to play that way. You know, Jen and I, we, we found situations where, boy, it would really be in my best interest right now to go ahead and do this because I'd probably draw and you'd... Um, but, but we didn't do it. Um, we did not go out of our way to screw each other over because unlike a lot of games, like I mentioned Flip City, in Flip City, when you have the opportunity to dump a um, residence card into your opponent's deck, you really better do it because if you're not doing it, you're hurting your own game. In Bottle Cap Viking, when you have the opportunity to hurt your player, you don't ha- your opponent, you don't have to do it because there's generally enough other things that, well, no, it's just as valuable for me to do this other thing rather than really try to screw my opponent. And so, Jen and I, we found that very refreshing. Um, that, you know, that was actually very attractive. Um, but what was more often the case is we get into situations where we are both have a lot of damage chips. And, um, and you know, there was one time when we were playing, and like, okay, I really need to do this. I need to collect double lumber, which means I have to draw another damage chip. And just like, don't do that. What are you doing? It'll, it'll, it'll destroy us both. I got to do it. I need to get more lumber because, I, or more gold, because I'm about to upgrade and I need the gold. Otherwise, this whole trip around the Rondell will have been useless. I'm going to do it. And she said, don't do it. I'm going to do it. Don't do it. And I did it, and it was the Valkyrie. And we both got smacked around. Um, but you know, I didn't feel bad about that because we both suffered. But man, if I could have not, and I was like, a, there was a, like a, I think it got to a 50 50 chance. I had a 50 50 chance of, of drawing the Valkyrie or not. But I wasn't too terribly worried about it if I didn't draw if I did draw the Valkyrie because I knew we'd both su- I wouldn't suffer the setbacks alone. So um, you know that didn't I mean so it was interesting how the game encouraged me to be very reckless at that point. And so that's a very cool element of the game that you know with this very simple I. I I can't stress enough how small the footprint of this game is. It's called Bottle Cap Vikings for a reason. The central piece is not much bigger than a bottle cap. And so it's going to be, I think, a game that we definitely consider taking with us whenever we go to a restaurant because it takes up no space on the table. And yet there's a surprising amount of replayability. Every time you set up, you're going to get a different amount of stuff. And it's just really rock solid. We very much enjoyed Bottle Cap Vikings. Okay, folks. I'm at an hour and 10 minutes. Yikes. And I've yet to talk about anything else. But you know what? I think I'm going to let my batteries recharge here for a bit. So I'm going to take a breather, refill my water cup, and we'll be back shortly to talk about games of interest. See you soon. Hold, please. All right. Are you still with me? I'm sure I shook off more than a few folks with that ridiculously long-winded, bombastic what-have-we-been-playing section. Hopefully, the games of interest section will go a little bit quicker because, to be honest, I haven't played these games, so I don't know as much about them. So hopefully that means I'll have less to say. Fingers crossed. Let's get going. Righty. Starting off with a biggie. Very excited about this. Legends of Andor, Chadra and Thorn. Now, long-time viewers of Rotto Runs Through know how much of a huge fan I am of Legend of Andor. I should say both Jen and I, we absolutely love that game. And we've been waiting patiently, ever so patiently, for Cosmos or Fantasy Flight or somebody to start releasing all the awesome expansion content that's been made available for the game over the years in English. And I think I mentioned in the last podcast that finally, hooray, yes! Legend of Andor stuff is going to be coming out. You know, the all the expansions that have come out will be made available. My understanding is this here at Essen. Although, Chandra and Thorn is something completely different. This is a totally standalone cooperative card game set in the Legends of Andor universe from a completely different designer, from Gerhard Hecht, who has recently you know, rocketed to the top of my must-watch designers list because of the excellent, excellent, excellent Kashgar Handler der Siedenstrasse, which I've done a run-through for. Um, you know, I've already talked about it at great length. It's an amazing triple threat deck builder game, and Jen and I absolutely adore it. I think it's just phenomenal game. So anything Gerhard is going to put out is instantly on my watch list. But then, if that weren't enough, boom! He's going to make a game, a cooperative card game, in the Legends of Andor universe. How awesome is that? And then, what's also incredibly cool about this is... While it is a standalone cooperative card game, it can also function as an extension. It can integrate into the Rise of the North expansion that I already mentioned. Up till now, we English speakers have not been able to get it, but presumably it's finally going to come out in English, and at the same time, we can actually get this whole extra additional bunch of stuff in it with this card game. 
I, my mind is blowing at the possibilities of this. I am so incredibly excited. I am so glad Cosmos has taken back Legends of Andor from Fantasy Flight, who were just letting it wither on the vine. They were just letting it rot. I don't know why. It's such an amazing game. And it looks like they're going to be giving it a lot of love this year. Cannot wait. That's all I know. There's no pictures. There's no nothing. No idea how the integration works. But still, I could not be more excited about this. But that's just the first of several very exciting games. Next up, from Vladimir Suchi, who uh, previously designed the Shipyard and Last Will, both of which Jen and I absolutely adore. Shipyard, I think, is just, it, for the longest time, is in my top 10. I think it's my number 11 or number 12 now. And Last Will is absolutely phenomenal. I think that made it into Jen's top 10 or her top 20. But still, those are both awesome games. Vladimir has been off the radar for quite a while. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and he's bringing out a new game this year. It's called The Losers Club. And it is a sequel to Last Will. It is the same basic conceit. You've got a bunch of money. You've got to burn through it the fastest by joining the Losers Club. And, but it's a, it's a completely new game with new and different ways to spend your money. But here's what's absolutely brilliant about it. This is what I'm so excited. Much like, what's it, uh, the Legend of Chadra and Thorn, which integrates into you know the main game, Legends of Andor. In this case, the Losers Club is a standalone game, but Last Will can integrate into it. If you can believe that. I mean, which is, you know, again, totally mind-blowing. I don't know much about it. There's, there's hardly any information. But one person who actually got to see it at the UK Game Expo, and oh my god, I'm so bummed I didn't go to the UK Game Expo because I would have played the heck out of this if I'd known it was... But anyway, anyway what, he had a very quick report which said basically it's a freestanding game and there's basically three ways in the game, three modules you can be playing to get rid of your money. You can be getting rid of your money through po politics. Uh, or basically, there's three modules, politics, friends, and money. So the game is standalone with these three modules, but what you can do is, if you have a copy of Last Will, you can add Last Will and it replaces the Friends module. So what is just a little module in Losers Club can become like a whole other separate game by adding Last Will in on top of it. Now, I have no idea how that works, but again, my mind, I think this is like the third or the fourth time I've mentioned now in the space of 10 minutes, is completely blown by this. I love this notion of you know these kinds of standalone games that can integrate and become part of of a greater whole by mixing and matching two games together. I mean, that's just really, really cool. And plus, Vladimir Suchi is just such a phenomenal designer. I mean, I wish he were putting out a game every year, so anytime he does put one out, that is cause to celebrate, and that's why I'm very excited about the Losers Club. Okay, next up. And this one, I don't even have a name for it yet, but I found online some pictures somebody took at a convention in France, I think. I forget where it was taken. But basically, it shows an upcoming Stefan Feld game, which is a reimagining of Castles of Burgundy that ups the dice quotient significantly. Um, you know, I want to say it's Castles of Burgundy, the dice game, although you can't really quite say that because, of course, dice play a huge role in Castles of Burgundy already. For those who don't know, Castles of Burgundy is in my top ten of all time. It's the best Stefan Feld game out there as far as I'm concerned, although Jen would disagree. She's partial to Amerigo and Bruges, but Castles of Burgundy is still the... The, the top of the heap as far as I'm concerned. But in that game, every round, every turn on your turn, you roll two dice, and those two dice determine what you can do uh, because there's a kind of a marketplace with a bunch of tiles you could grab that have pips on them. So you could use your two die that you rolled to grab a certain tile. You also have your own little landscape that you're building to. So you could use that two die you rolled to take a tile you'd gotten in a previous round and put it into the number two space in your region, on your, on your little map. Or you could use the two die to collect goods that are piling up on the dock in the two space so that you could later on ship them. So you can do a bunch of stuff with your dice. It's already a heavy dice game, but now you've got Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. And I don't know much about it, but looking from this picture, which you can see on my Games of Interest list um, on, on BoardGameGeek, if you, if you take a look at it, what it looks like is... In this game, you start with your region already completely built, and you're rolling the dice to activate areas that are in your region, as opposed to rolling the dice to actually build your region. So, I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm, I'm looking at this picture, and it looks 
very, very exciting. Plus, it's a Steffen Feld game, so of course it's exciting. And then apparently, if that weren't enough, apparently at this this convention, wherever it was, there was also rumor of a Castles of Burgundy card game. And so, you know, oh my gosh, I mean... In case you, I, I, I'm not going to repeat myself again. I'm not once again going to talk about how my mind is blown by all these exciting, uh, you know, things that are coming out. But still, let's just suffice to say I'm very, very excited. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to dial back the excitement just a little bit now to some other things that I'm just very interested in. Council of Four looks like it's going to be the next game from the design duo behind Zulk and the Mayan Calendar and Dungeon Bazaar and Voyages of Marco Polo, which I talked about earlier in this very podcast. I should really look up who these guys are so I can actually reference them by name instead of just saying, these guys. Let's see. Come on, Board Game Geek. Don't let me down. Give me those names. I actually have a laptop sitting on my lap now. And you'd think I would have looked this up ahead of time so I wouldn't have to stall. But hey, here it is. Uh, Simone Luciani and Daniele T. Simone and Daniele, or Danielle, are going to be giving us Council of Four, which, again, there's not much information about it from what I've read, but apparently this is a game where you're trying to build a chain of buildings throughout the land, throughout the region. Kind of sounds like something similar to Hands of Teutonica, maybe, although I'm not really sure. But what's interesting about this game, and I have seen a picture of this, to be able to achieve your goals, to travel around the landscape and build all these these buildings in all these different towns, it creates a chain throughout the land. You have to interact with the local councils in all these different towns, the council of four. And you do that by actually trying to bribe members of the council to give you the permission to build what you need. And if you can't bribe them, you can get them fired and replaced with somebody that you can control. And you know, it, on the board, it looks like you know they're, they're almost kind of like on this conveyor belt of people that are waiting to get pushed into the council and you can push people out of the council or you can manipulate the people that are on the council. So I don't know anything about it other than this one picture I saw, but I know the pedigree of these designers is pretty high. And um, I'm kind of excited about this because, you know, again, getting back to Zulk and the Mayan calendar, this whole notion of this... of playing this game, this worker placement game, where the world moves. There's motion on the board. And the board kind of comes alive. It looked kind of like Council 4 might have something similar to that with the way that the conveyor belt of the council works. Don't get me wrong, it's not actually a physical conveyor belt. But still, I don't know much about it other than I'm excited because of the designer pedigree. That's Council of Four. Okay, next up. This is an interesting one. Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, which is going to be coming from Portal Games and designer Ignacy Trevcek. Trevcek. Uh, who, you know, you know, that's a killer combination. I mean, Ignacy's uh, Preda Porter is awesome. You know, um, what do you call it? What do you call it? What do you call it? I can't think of the word. Stronghold is awesome. A lot of people love Imperial Settlers. I mean, you know, the, the man is an awesome designer. A really, you know, he's a powerhouse in the industry with good reason. And he's going to be bringing out, does he, you know, this is his game, Rattle Battle, Grab the Loot. Although not exactly. This is an interesting situation. There is a this this is a a dice based pirate ship game where the dice represent pirate ships on the board. But this is not going to be the only game that uses a system of dice that you roll onto the board to represent all the ships that are in the you know region of the Caribbean. There's another game coming out called Pirates of the Seven Seas. And now, and I think Pirates of the Seven Seas might be coming out first. Let me look up who that one is being published for. You think I would have looked this up ahead of time? What is wrong with me? You think I'd edit this out, and yet you're listening to me right now. Phil, okay, this one—it's uh, coming from um, Pandasaurus Games or iGames. It's coming from iGames, the original. Uh, and so it's this new system that was developed uh, by Oleg uh, Sidorenko and um, Oleksandr Nev- Nevisky. And it looks like a really cool system. Basically, what you do is you take your game box, you take the lid, you put it upside down, and on the lid is the actual game board that represents this section of the Caribbean, of of the ocean. And you take a whole bunch of dice that represent all different kinds of ships, pirate ships and and freighters and and, and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, merchant ships, and you roll them, and they bounce all around inside the lid, and where they come to rest, and the pips they come to rest on represent where all these ships are and what their relative strengths are. And now, Pirates of the Seven Seas, the 
original game that introduced this gameplay concept, which seems like a very, very cool idea, is a pretty straightforward kind of light family game where players are basically all just trying to shoot each other's ships down. And so when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, well, that sounds like a, a neat, cool little system. I, I like the idea of this kind of really innovative dice world creation, but then it's all to serve the purpose of players just shooting each other. So I was kind of meh. But then I found out that Portal Games had licensed the game concept. Uh, you know, In the same way I talked about earlier, Tasty Minstrel Games licensed the Star Realms gameplay design to make Cthulhu Realms, so Portal licensed the Pirates of the Seven Seas gameplay system to make Rattle Battle grab the loot. And I gotta say, I love this, this new kind of development. There's these two stories back to back of publishers, you know, who normally you'd think would be at each other's throats trying. Well, of course, the board game industry is a very, very friendly industry. All the publishers get along. I mean, you know, it, it's it's not really that cutthroat. But you know, they are still in competition. But the thing is, this is two examples. Um, of a publisher really liking a gameplay mechanism from another publisher saying, hey, you know what, that's so great. We're going to contact them and we're going to license that idea from them instead of just taking it. That's awesome. That's just so lovely. I mean, I hope to see more of that in the future. I really, really like the idea. But back to Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, the reason I'm so happy this is happening is because it's taking this very cool idea that's introduced in Pirates of the Seven Seas, but now it's turning it into a game where players don't attack each other at all. Instead, we're all a bunch of pirates competing to be the first to grab the richest loot that's on the board. All these merchant vessels that are um, going around, we're trying to get to them because they're worth a lot of points, but we're also trying to um, stay away from all the uh, you know the 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 navy ships that are going to shoot us down, and so it becomes a race instead of a player elimination battle. And that sounds so awesome. And so suddenly, I've gone from being, um, oh, that's too bad for Pirates of the Seven Seas, because again, Jen and I don't want to shoot each other out of the ocean, to something that I'm very, very excited about, because I love this core idea. And more even than that, I love the idea of publishers working together. I mean, I just think that's really, really awesome. I'm, I'm very, very excited to see how it all works out. So that was Rattle Battle Grab the Loot. Okay, next up, we have got Dice City. And I think this is actually going to debut at S or not sorry at S and at Gen Con this year, just a month from now. And it's one of the reasons I'm very, very sad I will not be at Gen Con this year because I would beat feet to be first in line at Portal, because this is a actually it's a co-publishing thing between Portal and AEG. And uh, so I think it'll be AEG who has it at Gen Con, where it's launching. Uh, this is a game from the designer of Among the Stars, which is an excellent, excellent game, which has spawned a series of really nice promos and expansions. We absolutely love this game. And so this is that designer's new big follow-up game. And all I know about it is we're rolling dice to build cities. I have seen some artwork. It looks very, very pretty, very charming, very colorful. And and um, that's all I know. And uh, but just based solely on the pedigree, Among the Stars is so great. I, I could not be more excited for Dice City. Very, cannot wait to see it. I uh, see. Let me double check that. I know it's from AEG. Was it from Portal or was it Artipia that are putting this out? Okay. Once again, you'd think. Okay, I'm not going to apologize. I'm done apologizing for my total and complete lack of preparation. Uh, you folks, I'm sure you're fine with it. Let's see. It is from Alderock. Or from AEG. Oh, okay. So it is just, I thought it was AEG and Artipia or Portal, but apparently not. It's just all AEG all the time. My mistake. And from, you know, uh, oh, I don't know how to say his name. Oh, yeah, no, it is. It is a cross promotional thing between Alderock and Artipia. Uh, Artipia, who had previously put out Among the Stars. So I'm sure they will be bringing Dice City to Europe, while AEG will probably be bringing it to North America. I don't really know. I have no inside information. All I know is I want to play this game now. From Vangelis uh, Bagiarctus. Uh, sorry, Vangelis, I don't know how to say your name. Greek names are hard, but that is Dice City. Looks really, really cool. Okay, next up, we have Shadow Rift, second edition. Now, Shadow Rift, I did a run-through for a long time ago. This is, I don't know if it's the first cooperative deck-building game, but it might be. 
Uh, you know, I mean, after the popularity of Dominion, I mean, Thunderstone, to be fair, did come with a cooperative variant, but Shadow Rift was just like this really small little independently published game. You know, uh, the designer d did all the work himself, and this was before the days of. Kickstarter being so popular, so you know he did the work. It was a little passion, labor of love, and we really enjoy the game, even though you know the production quality of it was not the greatest in the world. And to be fair, the original first edition we have did come with some weird glitches in it. Like there's some of the boss monsters that, that you know their their function, their fundamental powers don't make sense. So it's just a, you know it was kind of like a rough and ready first production. So I am so excited that Shadow Rift is now getting a second printing with all new art that looks brilliant. Just looks at you know the original Shadow Rift looked nice, but this new stuff looks you know just gobsmackingly good. Plus um, this new second edition is coming out just in time for its first big expansion as well. So this is hopefully going to be the year of Shadow Shatterrift. I'm so excited about this one. I actually backed it on Kickstarter. I don't back many Kickstarter games, um, you know, particularly when I've got to get it shipped from America. But I, you know, again, we love Shatterrift so much, and for reasons why, you can go back and watch my run through I did for it a million years ago. But the second edition, in addition to the expansion coming, very very exciting times. Okie doke. Uh, next up. Legacy Time Surge. Now, this is a sequel to Legacy Gears of Time, and that's all I know. But Legacy Gears of Time is one of the best games to have ever captured time travel as an interesting set of mechanisms. And so, this is basically the sequel. It's a lighter game, faster playing, and it's all about card drafting, which we absolutely love. Legacy Gears of Time is a great, great game, but it's predominantly an area majority, area control game. So, that makes it a little bit aggressive. And Jedi, we still enjoy it, in spite of the fact that it's a little bit more aggressive than what we normally go for, because the time travel is so brilliantly integrated into this game. So, if we're revisiting the core concepts of time travel, you know, as, as a follow-up, but we're doing it with card drafting, oh my gosh, color me excited. Okay, but not as excited as I am for the next one on the list, Shadowrun Crossfire High Caliber Ops. <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, as soon as I heard about this, I forgot about everything else that's coming out. This is the first of hopefully many, many, many expansions for Shadowrun Crossfire. It has a bunch of new stuff, new characters, you know, new black market cards, new obstacles, new missions, new upgrade stickers, everything. Just everything you would want, more, 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 more stuff. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still totally in love with Shadowrun Crossfire. Still adored to death, still haven't, I mean, I haven't gotten to 40 karma points yet. I'm in the mid 30s now. Um, but still enjoying the heck out of it, but cannot wait for more. Cannot wait for new things to buy, new things to fight. Um, even if nothing else was ever going to come out, I've gotten so much play out of the base game, but now, I mean, it's just going to breathe new life into already one of my favorite games. It's, Shadowrun Crossfire is in my top 10 games of all time. It was the best game of 2014 by far. And so, knowing the expansion for it is coming out this year, oh, that fills me with delight and joy. Okay, uh, next up, Villages of Valeria. This one I'm almost didn't even think about mentioning it because the um, this is a sequel to Valeria Card Kingdoms, which is a game that hasn't been released yet. I did a run through for it a couple of months ago for its Kickstarter campaign, but the full game hasn't come out. But they've already announced the sequel to it, Villages of Valeria. Now, Valeria Card Kingdoms, which again you can watch my run through for, was uh, you know a fantasy version of Machi Koro. Jen and I, as it turns out, were not fans of Machi Koro. We did not fall in love with it like everybody else seemed to do. But Valeria Card Kingdoms took Machi Koro ideas and really pushed it to a whole other level and you know, made a very, very cool fantasy-themed game with some absolutely drop-dead gorgeous art. Some of the best art I've ever seen in board games. From one, a really hot new designer called The Miko. Um, every game he's going to put his art on, I'm going to want to check out because I mean, he just elevates the game uh, you know, so, so much. But anyway... So, um, they already have now announced Villages of Valeria, and where um, Valeria Card Kingdoms was basically a, an upgraded, you know, a, a retooling of the ideas in Machi Koro, Villages of Valeria, it, it, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but it kind of sounds like a souped up version of San Juan, with um, you know, players being able to choose roles or you know, choose actions that other players get to be able to follow, plus card drafting and, and plus fantasy from the same artist. Very excited for Villages of Valeria, although nothing is known. There's no pictures. I mean, this is, I can't imagine this is even going to come out until 2016. So it's probably silly of me to even mention it, but I'm mentioning it because I'm excited 
and I like talking about things I'm excited about. Okay. Next up is Minerva. Now, it seems like every year at Essen, there's like this whole raft of games that come out that were you know, designed and developed in Japan or in, you know, in, in various places in Asia, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, whatnot. Uh, and it's interesting. You know, I mean, there, there's always this... And, and at Essen, there's a huge rush for them. Uh, you know, the, uh, the was it the Japan Japan group booth is just completely mobbed on the first day as hundreds of people descend on them trying to get first because they're first come first serve. And um, I have to admit, I always kind of I, I always feel kind of lucky because I can kind of ignore that whole mob because I don't know what it is, but there's something about maybe about the culture. The you know the the Asian culture where, where these developers are coming from because it seems like the vast majority of them always focus on at least three players. You know they they never really try very hard to make solid two player games. Whenever they do include two player like in Love Letter or Lost Legacy, it's generally not very good, and oftentimes they don't even bother. So I'm always kind of happy that hey you know that's one less thing I got to worry about on day one, hour one, minute one of Essen trying to get over there to get some of those. But this year. Minerva is one of those games that are coming out. And I've seen pictures of it. It's a tile laying game set in ancient Roman times uh, with players, you know, trying to lay tiles out to, you know, build up the best, you know, Roman city, which is, you know, a very, very well covered genre. I've seen it before, but it is from the designer of trains. And Trains, if you remember when I did that run-through for it a few years ago, oh my gosh, I so fell in love with that game. I fell in love with that game hard. And that was a game that worked very, very, very well right out of the box as a two-player game. And so now, that designer, um, Hayashi... Uh, Hayashi... Er, H- 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 Hishashi Hayashi, I think. Sorry, uh, Hisashi, for messing your name up there, is back... And you know, it looks like a it looks like a a, a solid tile lane game. Jen, I love tile lane games. We're always looking for something new. And so now I'm kind of worried. Do I have to beat feet like crazy to that booth um, and get there early? Well, we'll see. But I, I can't wait to find out more about it. Okay. Uh, that was well, I've already forgotten the name of it because so I've scrolled down. That was Minerva. If I didn't mention the name already. Okay, next up. Oh, uh, very very cool looking game. This has some beautifully gorgeous looking art. There's a couple of art samples again. You can see on my games of interest geek list. It's called Shakespeare, and it is a worker placement game all about trying to basically players are competing to put on the best play in the Globe Theater in the time of Shakespeare. So you have to deal with your actors and their needs. You have to deal with building sets. You have to deal with costumes. You have to deal with uh, the audience. You have to deal with all this stuff. And while I don't know much about the gameplay, I can see from the art that it's going to be absolutely gorgeous. And I have to admit, I absolutely love the notion. It's a very attractive theme to me. Uh, you know, The notion of trying to get everything ready so you can put on the ultimate play, that is a structure that works so well in so many games like Preda Porter where you're trying to prepare and put on the best fashion show or um, oh what was the the uh, Trakirian where you're trying to prepare to put on the best magic show and now you've got Shakespeare trying to put on the you know the best Shakespeare play uh, looks great looks gorgeous cannot wait to learn more it's from his starry games can't wait uh, that is Shakespeare okay almost done folks uh, what do I have I think I just have yep just two more just two more next up Apollo 13. And very little is known about this right now. It's from a relatively new designer who's put out a couple other games, including 1969, which was another game that kind of focused on the same subject matter, you know, the uh, space race uh, you know, of the, of the 60s between America and the U.S. And so this is an entire game. Uh, it is a cooperative game about players trying to survive the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. And for folks who don't know what the Apollo 13 mission is, you know what? I, all I can do is recommend go watch the movie Apollo 13, directed by Ron Howard, starring Tom Hanks and Bill Paxton and Kevin Bacon. It is an excellent Excellent movie over, you know, it's an incredibly dramatic story about these astronauts, you know, on the way to the moon and they suffer a major malfunction on board. It's where the famous quote, Houston, we have a problem comes from. And, um, you know, that subject matter is so exciting. And the fact that it's a cooperative game, everybody, you know, trying to survive, you know, this incredibly arduous thing. And, uh, and then on top of that, 
I saw a picture of, of some of the pro, or no, no, I, I saw a list of the components that come with the game. I haven't seen a picture of it at all, but I saw a list of the components, and one of the components was a sand timer. So that means there is a real time component to this cooperative game as well. And that, plus the theme, gets me so excited about Apollo 13. Um, I, can't, I cannot wait to find out more. But yeah, just thought I'd mention it because it, it sounds really, really cool. And then finally, the last one um, on this Games of Interest. How long have I been going? Oh, this is much better. I'm at 27 minutes. Yes, much better. Octodice. Now, this is an odd one. This is a real oddball because this is effectively a sequel to Stefan Feld's game from last year, Aquasphere. Which yeah, I've done a run through for. It was basically a game of uh, a, of a two man science team working at the bottom of the ocean in this aquasphere, you know, this underwater research lab, trying to do research into these mysterious crystals, um, deal with octopods, which were kind of trying to destroy the lab, and you know, competing to program their robot helpers to you know stay one step ahead of the competition. It's a very, very cool game. And, you know, standard Steffenfeld style, really, really clever core mechanisms, a million different ways to score points, really, really deep, involving, fun, fun Euro game. And actually, interestingly, it may be Steffenfeld's most thematically grounded game to date. So, really loved it a lot. And now, a sequel is coming out called Octo Dice. And the interesting thing is, this is not being designed by Stefan Feld. It's from a brand new designer, Chris Toussaint. Sorry, Chris, I don't know how to get your French last name there. Uh, looks like Toussaint, maybe. Um, you know, is this going to be his first design? And so Chris is basically revisiting the theme of Aquasphere, but turning it into a dice game. And I don't know much about it. All that it says in Board Game Geek is every turn you get to roll six dice, three white and three black. Of those six dice, you'll pick two dice, one white, one black, pair them together to do an action. Or to, and that's how you're going to pick the two actions you're going to do this turn. Now, what this sounds like to me is following from the theme of Aquasphere where players had control over a scientist and a programmer, and that scientist and programmer had to work in, you know, had to find ways to synergize their actions to be able to succeed. What I suspect is happening here is the white dice are probably the scientist, the black dice is probably the programmer, and you have to roll both to find out what your program and your scientist is going to do. And um, I love that. I loved that in Aquasphere, and it sounds like this is basically taking Aquasphere and streamlining it down, because I've also seen a picture of the player board. It looks every bit as cool and complex with tons of variety and all kinds of things you can do with these dice. So... I can't wait to see more. Uh, but I love this notion of you know some designer probably who fell in love with the game so much that he decided to make a dice version of it, took it to Pegasus. I'm guessing. I don't know. I have no inside information, but I assume that's what happened. And so I cannot wait to try it. It sounds really, really cool. I just love the story. Uh, I would love to hear the story of how this came, came about. Octodice. And that's it, folks. Made it through just about a half an hour. Hopefully that gets us back on schedule. Next up, we're going to be moving on to Q&A. See you there in a second. Okay, sorry about that, folks. I, I have gone through, I don't know, it must be a couple of liters of water. My throat is so dry, I had to get up and I've got... Hope that won't be too distracting, the throat lozenge, because my throat is getting so... It's on fire here, but uh, you know, the show must go on, right? And uh, let me know what you think of my new transition sound. I, a lot of people didn't like the little chirp noise that I grabbed out of Audacity for my first one. Uh, I'm very curious to see what people think about my new transition choice. But anyway, moving on to Q and A. You may recall my first podcast. I asked for questions, and I got some, so I'm very excited. But um, I'm, I'm going to answer all of these, so I'm going to need some more for next podcast. So remember. Send your questions to questions at rado.com. Q U E S, or questions at R A H D O.com, so that we can make it into the next podcast. Okay, cool. Oh, by the way, also, when I was just uh, getting up in, in between, Jen uh, just mentioned to me that apparently it's 90 degrees in the shade today in Malta. And uh, as you might imagine, I am sweating up a storm. I don't really think that's going to matter too much. It's kind of a nice thing about the podcast. You don't have to see how my entire face is just glistening with sweat. And you certainly can't smell me. Good thing there's not smell-o-vision at the moment. 
But we're going to continue on. Oh, also, by the way, Jen also mentioned I totally lost track of time. Happy 4th of July, everybody. If, in fact, I get this posted today, it's uh, yay, 4th of July. And right, <laughs> that has nothing to do with questions and answers. So on to the Qs so I can give the A's. First up, John asks How often do you play games? Roughly how many per day slash week? And what's the ratio of filler to more lengthy games? Good question, John. Glad you asked. Well, this actually, I think I answered this in my recent live play in the QA we did there, but I'll try to go into a little bit more detail here. It's actually interesting. Up until recently, Jen and I were doing a system where I would, you know, we'd get up in the morning, I would film a run through and, and or read the rules of a game that we were going to play that afternoon. And in the morning, Jen would be working on glass. And, you know, because that's what she does. She's a glass artist. And then we'd both get together in the afternoon and play whatever the big game is, and then maybe a couple of filler games on top of that. Ever since we moved here to Gozo, that is the system we've been trying to do. And then on the weekends, even though it's weird, Jen and I have no reason to even recognize the concept of a weekend. We still would tend, you know, Jen decides, you know, she works during the week and she takes the weekend off, even though, you know, we both can make our own schedules. It's just weird. I mean, a lifetime of, of you know, five days a week is hard to break, five workday a week. But anyway, so that's what we've been doing for quite a while. And, you know, as such, I don't know, you could, you know, retroactively figure out what that is. I mean, we were playing. We would, uh, every day, we would, or not every day, usually four out of every five days, this would actually happen. But, you know, something would come up, you know, we'd have to do something else in the afternoon. But on average, we were probably doing that four uh, days out of the week. And then on either Saturday or Sunday, where Jen didn't want to work at all, we would play, we would do that one more time. So on average, you know, we would play five big games and then maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 little filler games. But, it worked great for me. I, I you know, it was absolutely perfect, but it was not good for Jen. And recently, over the last couple of months, we've changed the system entirely because it was really proving difficult for her because Jen has a hard time kind of redirecting her brain. You know, when, when she's got something on her mind, that's pretty much all she can think about. You know, it's just like, you know, drills down on it like a laser. Me, I'm, I'm used to multitasking. I'm just used to switching gears, switching lanes all the time. I had to do it for years as a game designer. But Jen, she likes to see one thing through. So it was very, very difficult for her to like really be focused on her glass in the morning and then, okay, I'm just going to put all that away now and for the afternoon I'm going to be thinking about this game. And it took her a long time before you know, she actually told me it was a problem because I didn't really quite realize. I thought it was going well. But eventually she said, yeah, this is really kind of difficult for me. And so we've recently changed and we're still working out the particulars. But what we're doing now instead is, um, on average, two or three. I go for three, Jen goes for two, because she's got other stuff to do, whereas I don't. We basically set it of a days in a week, we set aside as a game day where we basically play games all day long. I mean, you know, get up, have breakfast, and Jen's already at the table saying, right, what are we going to play today? Because that works so much better for her because she can just devote her mind to just one thing for the entire day. She doesn't have to worry about our finance. She doesn't have to worry about her glass customers. She doesn't have to worry about taking care of chickens or you know anything else that might have to be done. It's just all about games. And so we've been doing this now and getting regularly either two or three day game days a week. And under these circumstances, we're generally playing two or three really big games, you know, big heavy games, and then like two or three fillers. So it's actually interesting with this new system. I would say we're spending roughly about the same amount of time, about the same number of hours playing, but we're getting more big games covered, and it's and it's actually that's actually better for me um, because we're we're playing fewer fillers now. For a while, we've been playing tons and tons of fillers. It was why it was so easy for me to do my top ten fillers, uh, um, top ten filler video a while ago. But now I think we're going to be kind of pulling back on fillers because of this new system that works better for Jen. So we'll see how it goes. But basically what that translates to, on a bad week, we're basically playing, um, what, probably, well, if it's true either way, probably uh, 15 hours on average. Uh, you know, and on a good week, maybe more like 20 to 25 hours of gaming. And that's kind of a breakdown of the ratio of fillers to, to bigger games. Hopefully that answers your question, John. If not, Go to questions at rado.com and you can ask for more detail. But we're moving on to question number two from Dave. And Dave actually had two questions. First one, 
My question is, are there any mean games that you will still play because you can look past the meanness? And right, and then he gives some examples of what he means by that. Alrighty. And uh, right, and that's an easy question to answer. Yes, there are. In fact, I've been, I have had in the queue now, I've been ready to do Jens and my top 10 conflict heavy or mean games for, for, for months. I've put it on the voting roll several times, and the voters keep always making it like the least requested top 10 list I could possibly do. And I'm really surprised by that. I think people would love to see a top 10 list of you know conflict heavy games that Jen and I actually enjoy and get into. And you know, and for me to talk at length about why. Why because I, I, you know, I think it'd be a really interesting topic of conversation about, well, you know, okay, we, we hate all of these games, we hate 99%, but these 1% of conflict games we can actually enjoy. What is it about them that's different? What is it about them that makes Care Bear players like us? Because I've certainly got 10. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the wall right now. Um, we've got Claustrophobia. We've got, uh, oh, what? Uh, Atlas. We've got, I'm just looking around, right, Tash Kalar. Um, Heroes is a new game, or Hiroshi, which we only just recently got. I'm, I'm ho- I've got fingers crossed for Emergence Event. I just recently picked up Emergence Event, which I know has some meanness in it, but I'm hoping we'll enjoy it. Fingers are crossed so much for that. So there are actually there are several. And um, so yes, there, the answer to your question is yes, there are, and there were a couple of them. Maybe someday the voters will decide they would like to know more, and they'll actually give it enough votes, so I'll do a top 10 on that very topic. Question number two from Dave. I notice you do a lot of solo gaming for the show, or just two-player gaming with you and Jen. Does it ever frustrate you that you don't have more people to play with, like a game group? Certain games, like Cosmic Encounter or Resistance, have to be played with more people. Do you wish you could play games like that more often? That is an excellent question, and I will be honest. The answer is no. And it has nothing to do with, uh, um, you know, well, oh gosh, that's, 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 uh, that's, that was a... I could just stop right there and say the answer is no. I, I don't feel frustrated, but I probably should say why. Here's the main reason more than anything else. It, it, is, it does have to do with Rado runs through. Because of the situation I've put myself in, where I am pretty much now a full-time board game player and videographer, I spend so much time doing this, and I'm under a lot of pressure to get a lot of games covered. And quite frankly, any time there is a new game that I, I learn about, and I can see, oh yeah, oh, it's from one of my favorite designers, and oh yeah, it's from a great publisher, I know they do good stuff, and oh, it's a three-player game, at minimum. Oh, thank God, okay, that's one less game I have to worry about. Because, if it, you know, it's so nice that because I can just completely ignore all games that re- require at least three players, I mean, that must be 30% of all the possible games that I might potentially do run-throughs for. And it's, it's literally a lifesaver that I can ignore that many games, because I can barely keep up with all the games I cover right now. I mean, I say no to nine out of ten games that publishers ask me to cover when they're willing to send me. And you know that said, I, I still I end up having to buy about half the games because there's so many publishers out there who really just don't want to work with me at all and won't actually give me review copies, which is fine. That's their prerogative. I don't mind. So I still have to buy a lot of games. But you know, I am just happy that we have a metric like this. That, oh, if it doesn't support two players, if it's not good two players, boom, let's ignore it. Because there are so many games coming out. I don't know what I'd do with myself if suddenly I had the means to be able to play all these great three and four and five player games. So I am thankful that Jen and I, because of our remote geographic location on the far north end of Gozo, which is a tiny little island about two hours away from any other board game player in the world, um, you know, that we're kind of in this situation, but it works for us. So I could stop there, but I'm going to say something else as well. I do occasionally get to play with more than um, two players. Jen and I, you know, look at, we just went to the Zomer Spell, uh, where I got to play a four-player game with Marco Polo, and that was very nice. And in fact, I would say Marco Polo is a better four-player game than a two-player game. And um, even though I'll probably never get to play it as a four-player game again, and, you know, we still only play as a two-player game, you know, so that's kind of an example of, oh, wouldn't it be great to be able to play Marco Polo with more players in the future? Yeah, it would be. But I got to be honest, even when I have an awesome four-player experience with somebody, like that game at Zomer Spell. I'm often thinking, boy, you know what, this is fun, but I can't help but wonder if I'd be having more fun just playing two-player with Jen. Because, I'll be honest, we got in, Jen and I got into board gaming to you know, share the experience with each other. It's something that brings us closer as a couple. It's like both of our number one hobbies now 
And we just enjoy it so much. And while it's great to play with other people, in fact, there's a wonderful British couple who are retired like us, uh, David and Angela, and they come. They they have a. They're working on a retirement home in here in Malta. So once every three months or so, they come and they're here for like a couple of weeks, and and they're working on doing the, this fixer upper project of theirs. And so when they come, they usually swing by our place while they're here, or sometimes we swing by their place and we play a game. And that's always really a great opportunity for me. You know, we very much enjoy their company. They're a wonderful couple. They're funny. You know, they have a lot of the same interests as us, and they're great players. And, you know, we, we have a great time. But um, I never find myself, after we're done playing with them, saying, oh, man, I wish I could play four-player more often. Because, you know, the more players you have at the table, doesn't matter how wonderful they are, it takes longer to play the game. It takes longer for your turn to come back around to you. You know, now obviously, that's not true with some games. Some games, you know, with sim simultaneous play and all that, like Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders is a wonderful game. Doesn't matter. You can be playing with seven players, and it's just as smooth and fluid as if you were playing with three. I mean, that's great. But for most games... I often find myself thinking, even while I'm in the game, having fun, thinking, well, yeah, this is good, this is good. But not as good as just playing a nice little two-player game with me and Jen, where I'm totally comfortable. Uh, you know, Jen and I, we know each other. We're, we're, you know, we've been married for, gosh, coming up on 25 years. And you know, we're, we're, we're each other's best friend. We know each other so well. And you know, we, we, just, we have so much unspoken communication. The experience of playing a game just with Jen you know, is is incomparable. Um, you know, the, you know the, it's so much more wonderful. I mean, and again, that's that's not cast version. We love playing games with David and Angela. I love playing games with uh, another David. You know, a uh, uh, young Maltese designer. Uh, you know, we I, I, every once in a while I play a game with him. You know, but nothing can compare to playing a game with Jen and just Jen. Um, you know, we, occasionally we have you know people come to Malta all the time on vacation, and occasionally uh, we get. Geek mails on board game geek contact saying, "Hey, we're going to be in Malta. Can we come by and play a game?" And we usually say yes, unless they sound like they're crazy people. And that's always fun too. We definitely enjoy it. It's nice as a change of pace to do, you know, to kind of shake it up every once in a while. But I am just so happy, and I and um, you know, Jen's taking a nap right now. But I think she would agree that uh, for us, it's still all gaming is always as best when it's just me and her. So that answers that question. I hope I don't sound too elitist or standoffish, but that's. That's just the way it is. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Those were some excellent questions. Next up is uh, Gergo. Have you all... Let's see. Oh, have you thought of designing a board game yourself? Um, even if it's a no, what type of game would you like to see your name on? Well, I'll definitely... First of all, no. There is no way I would ever set out to design a board game because... Well, I mean, I designed video games for 20 years, and as as hard a work as that was, I think it would be harder to do a board game. Um, I, I just don't think I have the mindset for it. Plus, to be honest, I would worry about doing that because I found... Over 20 years making video games has kind of ruined video games for me. I now have such an analytical designer's mind, I have a hard time just sitting back and enjoying a video game like a consumer would. Even though I don't make video games anymore, I still evaluate them, I study them when I play them. And it's really robbed a lot of the enjoyment from, uh, from them for me. And if I, I would worry about the same thing if I were to become a prodigious board game designer like Stefan Feld or something like that, that the same thing might happen. Now, I'll be honest. I worry about that a little bit doing Rotto Runs Through that someday it might lead to burnout on my part because Rotto Runs Through implicitly requires me to play a lot of new games. And so I always worry about that in the back of my mind. And I worry about it even more for Jen because I know she would rather not play so many new games. She would rather revisit more of our favorites. But me, though, it's interesting... I kind of love the cult of the new. I love learning a new game and then playing it and being delighted by all the new exciting stuff. Jen loves digging down. Like I, I, I suspect a lot of players, maybe even most players, prefer to play one game over and over again and peel back more layers of the onion and discover more of its secrets. And don't get me wrong, I love that too. You know, we've played Agricola probably 30 plus times now. Uh, you know, and, and I still enjoy playing it. But Given the choice between playing a game of Agricola and playing whatever Uwe Rosenberg's new game is, I'd probably want to play the new game just because I love the new. I love the excitement of you know seeing some new set of mechanisms. Maybe again that comes back to me as a professional game designer myself. Um, you know maybe I am evaluating them. But um, long story short, I don't think I would be a good board game designer. Uh, the video game design skills I have, I think a lot of them would be applicable. 
but I know myself and I'm a bit too lazy. Uh, um, you know, I need to have external forces pushing me to finish something, like a publisher who's you know, given the company I work for several million dollars to make this game. I, I just don't think I'd be able to see it through. So yeah. But to answer your other question, if I were to ever design a board game, of course it would be a Euro. And I think it would be a Euro. What I'd want to do is a, you know, a you know, straight up trading in the Mediterranean, goods conversion type thing. You know, all the stuff I love, you know, Stefan Feldy type stuff. But what I'd like to see, and I haven't really seen, I've seen it in a couple of games, but I've never seen anybody really blow it out. I like the notion of an economic simulation where all the players in the game represent different elements of a, of an economic ecosystem. Normally, in a in an economic euro style game, everybody's a merchant. Everybody has access to the same type of actions and powers and stuff like that. And everybody's just trying to see who is the best at that. What I want to see is a game where you know what? It, when when we sit down uh, this turn. I am the merchant. I run a store and I, and I try to buy wholesale goods and sell them to the public. I deal with the public. I deal with um, you know, competing with other you know, game-led mer- you know, stores. And, but I need to stock my store. And I do that because there's another player at the table who is a manufacturer, who makes goods, who actually has to deal with importing you know, the, the raw components and the manufacturing process, and then trying to sell them to local stores and turning a profit. And you know, that player, meanwhile, um, you know, has to enter. You know, so Interval works, works with me very closely because I'm trying to run a store, and you know, I need their goods to sell it. They need me to sell their stuff. And meanwhile, there's another player who runs runs an import-export business. And his job is all about trying to you know, work the docks and bring stuff in. And then you'll get stuff, buy it wholesale, and therefore compete with the player who's trying to sell locally because he's trying to sell overseas. But he's also the stuff, the person who's bringing in all the raw materials that the manufacturer player needs to build the stuff that the store needs to sell. I love the idea of players who are all competing because it, you know, it is still a competitive game where the player who wins is the one who has made the biggest fortune. But um, the game is designed so that all the paths are balanced equally. Everybody has you know, an equally t- a challenging road ahead of them, but they work in synergy. I think that would be so awesome. I would love an idea, a game like that. Heck, I would almost love a game like that where there isn't any competition, where it doesn't matter who wins or loses. It's just everybody trying to do their best. Um, because I, I, I would just love to, from a, as a player, explore those kinds of interactions because that would be like the ultimate interactive game where players rely on each other um, you know, for all these critical things that are necessary. There's one game that did come out that tries to do this. Fallen City of Carez has this basic notion. And I loved it. Um, for it. But unfortunately, Fallen City of Carez, it didn't really work. It, it came with rules for a two-player game, but the two-player game didn't work very well. And it was obvious to me that it was designed as a three-plus player game. And I could see how it would work well as a three-player game, but it didn't work well as two. So I was kind of heartbroken. But I think that would be the kind of game I'd really love to see. Plus, I love Persistence. This game that I'm talking about, I would love it so that after we finish playing a game and you know, somebody was the winner because they made the most money, that the state of the world is finished. Or no, it's not finished. That it is permanent. That it stays. That the next time we play the game, the companies that we had built up and the status they're in and wherever they're at would be where we start playing the next game. And so all those... Um, but you know, maybe next time, I'll play the import-export guy and somebody else will play the thing, but I'll pick up where somebody else left off. Maybe they were really successful and I might end up driving that business into the ground. And you know, so playing Playing this game over multiple sessions would end up kind of telling the story of you know a hundred years. You know, every game represents like a three-year period in the evolution of this city as the city itself gets bigger and these companies get bigger and they branch out into more and more stuff. I just think that would be awesome and it'd be very, very exciting. And that would be something I would like to design. And that's probably why I'll never design a game because that game design is probably impossible. This is absolutely insane. You'd probably it'd probably need to be a video game to keep track of all the variables. But heck, maybe it could use an app. I don't know. But you know, that'd be it'd be something like that. But yeah, I'm never gonna do it because that's crazy. Let's see. Um, bah, bah, bah. And then uh, question two from Gorgo. Let's say you have a solid prototype. Would you try to knock on publisher doors or would you go straight to Kickstarter? Well, I'm never going to do it. But just as a hypothetical, if I could... Man. I'm, 
Well, that's not a fair question to ask because for me, I would probably go to publishers because I have a lot of relationships with publishers now because I've done Rotto Runs Through for several years. And so I, I, you know, I can just email them and I'm sure a lot of publishers would instantly be interested and they would probably do all that hard work. So that's what I would do because it would just be easy and there would be an easy path for me because I would instantly, I would, I would suspect, this might be a bit of hubris on my part, but I would expect a lot of publishers who, um, you know, who like me uh, would be interested in my game because I, because, you know, obviously there's a bit of a celebrity, a cult of celebrity around me and stuff like that too. But let's answer that question a different way. Let's say I'm a total nobody. I've never done Rotto Runs Through, but I've got this idea for a game. Under those circumstances, what would I do? Well, I think I would probably, you know, if I if say I'm living in Essen, I would probably go to uh, Essen and maybe some other. I, I'd probably try to contact them. But in all honesty, I got to admit, the Kickstarter path really kind of appeals to me. Um, and I think... I might try a little bit, but I bet you I'd probably become very frustrated with the trying to get in the my foot in the door with publishers, and I'd just go straight to Kickstarter before too long. Because I do know I'm good at selling. I'm good at selling my own stuff. And um, you know, there's so many tools out there now. Like Jamie Stegmeyer, specifically of Stonemeyer Game, has written so much really rock solid advice for people to learn how to run their own Kickstarter. I, f- I feel like there's a- enough information out there to be able to make a go of it. There are enough blueprints that um, you know people have published that you could follow. I think I'd be probably inclined to go that way if Rotto Runs Through didn't exist <laughs> in this hypothetical scenario, which will never, ever happen. And then let's see, uh, last question from Gergo, somewhat related to the previous question. As someone who spent several years in the video game industry, how do you see today's board game industry? Indies versus the big fish, traditional publishing versus Kickstarter, etc., etc. Hmm. Boy, I really should have thought about my answers before I sat down because I'm just kind of spitballing as I go. That is a good question. Um. Well, you know, it's very, very interesting. You know, the industries, of course, they they're night and day different. Uh, you know, the the economy of scale, the you know, the billions and billions of dollars that are made in the video game industry, and the millions and millions of dollars that are risked on every single game. You know, make it such a completely different ballpark than the biggest possible game you could have. You know, the biggest production from Fantasy Flight uh, Flight games. You know, with ton- hundreds of minis and you know, glossy stuff and you know, multimedia presentation launch campaigns and you know. Uh, being shown at, uh, at conventions all around the world is such a drop in the bucket compared to your normal triple A, you know, game video game like what I developed for years, doing Fable, Siphon Filter, Brink, you know, Pitfall, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, on, on one level, there's really not that much overlap. If anything, I would say, you know, I guess there is this burgeoning indie industry in the video game industry where, you know, game developers like me who've done, you know, big uh, ticket items for years are getting kind of burned out and they want to make their own thing instead of having to be beholden to the man and stuff like that. So, you know, again, if, in an economy of scale, even still, making a, a small little indie video game is going to cost a few million dollars as opposed to making a, a you know, a, a big elaborate board game is going to still cost a fraction of that. So the economics of scale, I just, I just don't, I don't know. If there's that much overlap between them, I probably should have thought about this a little bit more. But yeah, it you know it's it it, it really is apples and oranges. If, if you want to talk about the business side, uh, if you want to talk about the you know the creative side, you know the 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 process. I think probably the most interesting thing is board games. To develop a board game, it's such a pure representation of designer intent. Nothing gets between the designer. And the consumer, the player, you know, what's on that board is what he wanted. Now, of course, that's not entirely true. Of course, you know, if you take it to a publisher, you will have to deal with an editor. They will want to make changes. But even still, you have to, as a designer, make so many compromises to technological constraints, to financial constraints, to market constraints. When you're making a video game, um, you know, I've never made a video game that is a pure representation of what I wanted. Even Siphon Filter, the first video game I ever designed, which to this day is probably still the closest to being purely what I wanted to do, in part because it was a small 20-man team. It was back before um, it it required 100-plus people to make a video game. So it was a smaller team, it was smaller budgets, and I was given more flexibility and control. But even still, I mean... That a game I originally wanted to be based. I, I kind of patterned it after um, was it 
that Antonio Banderas special Sloan movie, Assassins, from the Wachowski brothers. Uh, I originally wanted it to be a game about assassins instead of a game about government agents trying to save the day. But the publisher was not comfortable with that. They, you know, This was a long time ago. This is back when a publisher would say, no one's going to want to play as a bad guy. That will fail at the market. Even though I said, no, people want to be the bad guy. Trust me. But you know, so I, even still, I had to compromise. And I had to compromise like crazy on that game because um, my vision was it was basically going to be a John Woo hard boy movie in video game form. It was going to be the first game that ever existed. And of course, Siphon Filter didn't turn out exactly like that. You can kind of see the inspiration there, but it didn't turn out that way. So still, I had to compromise because of memory restraints, because of so many things. But with a board game, there's no constraints. There's no limit. Whatever you want on those cards, whatever you want on that board, you can do it. And I think that's kind of beautiful. Um, you know, I think there's a purity to design in board games that I'm very jealous of. Although that said, I'm not jealous enough to ever try to do it myself, to get back to your first question. And so that was it from Gergo. Excellent questions. Thank you. Moving on to Ben. Who, at, who says, actually this is a statement, not a question. I would be highly interested in knowing what led to your relocation from the USA to Malta. How would you compare and contrast the two places? And was it hard to get citizenship? All right. Okay, there was a question there. He just didn't put a question mark at the end. All righty. Well, um, uh, we came to Malta because when we were living, we, uh, you know, as Americans, what was it? I was 35, and I was looking for something new. You know, I, I was very, very successful. I'd been already doing video game development for about a decade. I'd done Cypher Filter. I'd done a bunch. I'd done The Sims when I was in Texas and stuff like that. And we were living in Texas, Austin, Texas at the time. And I loved Austin, Texas. It's, it's such a great city. One of the best cities in the world. But Jen had a very hard time living there. The, the pollen, the fire ants, the humidity. I mean, Jen could just never leave the house. It was, she was physically miserable as, mu as much as we both loved the city and everything it offered. And so we were looking for something new. And for you know, as long as Jen and I had known each other, we had always talked about wanting to live overseas. Not visit, but live. Not just go for a vacation, but to actually live and feel the culture change instead of just observe it. And I remember... It was on my 35th birthday. We went to a Chinese restaurant in Austin, and I cracked open my fortune cookie, and it said, you will soon travel, ac you, you will soon travel across the great water, or something like that. I carried that fortune cookie in my, um, you know, that little slip of paper in my wallet for years until I eventually lost it, because that was, it felt like that was the universe. Because we were, it was, um, it was my 35th birthday, we were talking about, right, what should we do? Should we go to Europe? We've wanted to do it forever, or, or should we just, um, should we you know, just, you know, because Jen couldn't stay in Austin anymore. We had a lot of options. And that fortune cookie kind of pushed us over the edge. There was a lot of other stuff too. Like for a long time, we didn't want to come to Europe because the quarantine rules, we did not want to put our dogs in a kennel for six months while they went through quarantine. That was unthinkable to us. But then, so, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, pet passport system had come into play so we didn't have to do quarantines. That was another thing that helped us finally be able to move overseas. So all these things kind of combined to be the perfect storm right when I was around 35 and we moved. And we moved to England where I went to work at Lionhead to do Fable 2. Although originally I went over there to work on the console version of the movies and I did a little bit of work on the movies for PC and then when the movies for PC kind of dried up, the console version got cancelled, which broke my heart. That was going to be such an awesome game. That would have been one of the best games I ever made. But it worked okay because I ended up moving over to be a designer, a lead designer on Fable 2. So it worked out okay. But we ended up staying in England for about eight years. Uh, and that we stayed there long enough working for two different companies that we were able to get our citizenship. And it was just, you know, it was not very hard to get citizenship. I, we had to do a bunch of tests. We, uh, you know, we had to study a lot. Both Jen and I had to swear fealty to the queen and that we would protect the realm and all that kind of stuff, which was kind of fun. There was actually a picture of the queen and we had to hold hand on heart and swear our allegiance to her. But, you know, it was, uh, the only hard part was getting a company to employ me for eight years because once you've been in England employed for eight years, you're eligible for citizenship. And so we got it. And you know, it wasn't six months later that we said, okay, well, we're done. Because before, up until we had that citizenship, I was kind of an indentured servant. I had to keep working or we had to leave the country. But once I had my dual citizenship, then you know, the sky was the limit. We, you know, we, we're the... Uh, hopefully, please, UK, please don't leave the EU. Don't be ridiculous. Um, because as a UK citizen, I... you know. We can travel and live and work anywhere in the EU that we want. Yay, because it's a European Union. And so this job opportunity came up in Malta. 
And Jen and I had never for one second thought about living in Malta. We knew nothing about it. But we thought, hey, that sounds kind of cool. It's just going to be for a year. Let's come here. It'll be kind of like a nice extended you know, Mediterranean vacation. And um, after the job dried up, it kind of went south really quick and things went pear-shaped. But we liked Malta so much, we decided to stay. And um, Malta, the cost of living here is so crazy low, we ended up getting this wonderful little two-bedroom flat. It's right on the ocean. Um, it's quiet nine months out of the year. There's nobody here. Um, you know, Jen can continue to do her glass work. I can do Rado runs through, and it's just perfect for us. And I don't know how long we're going to stay here, but it's probably going to be for a while because it's just great. And um, let's see. Contrast the two places, the U.S. versus the EU. Oh, man, that's like I could do a whole show on that. The biggest thing you've got to bear in mind, if you're a United States citizen and you're thinking about tr moving to Europe, doesn't matter where, you have to get prepared for a massive culture shock. Specific for in, in a lot of ways. Number one thing, whatever money, however much money you're making doing whatever you're doing in the U.S., your um, actual spendable income, your um, quality of life index is going to get cut in half. Americans make so much more money than Europeans doing just about anything. You know, um, in terms of the raw buying power, your salary, you've got to be prepared for that. Um, you know, Americans are just crazy rich. And so, you got, you, like I said, just be ready for it. Jen and I were, so it wasn't too much of a culture shock. Uh, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I still made a lot of money making video games here in Europe, but it was a drop in the bucket compared to what I made in the States. And then you've got to get prepared for a fundamental shift in attitudes towards customer service. <laughs> um, and that, you know, that goes for, for help on phone lines, that goes for delivery timings, that goes for getting your cable installed, that goes for everything. No, you know, w to be fair, we have only lived in England and Malta. But it's weird. You know, we went from America, the land of awesome customer service, to England, to the land of... Nah. You know, okay, we'll be there sometime this afternoon to deliver the fridge, as a, you know, or whatever it might be. And then I mean, I, we went from the big country of America to the the small island of England, and took a big drop in pay, took a big drop in you know customer service quality. Then we moved to an even smaller island, to Malta, where there's an even bigger drop in you know actual salary, um, and even more laid back approach to customer service. I mean, Malta is so weird. You know, there, 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 you know, there's some critical component we need for just some day-to-day -day life thing. Trying to find out a store that has it, forget about it. Um, you know, it's going to be incredibly hard to find unless you've grown up here and you've known your whole life where this weird little store in some closet somewhere in some back street in some small town is that has this particular thing you need, this gizmo, whatever it might be. But then you, you find out there's a shop that has it, trying to find that shop? Good luck. Um, half the shops here, they don't even bother putting signs out to advertise where they are. Um, addresses? There's no, con there's no consistent concept. Most people don't even know what their zip code is in Malta because there's just, because everybody's just grown up here. They just, everybody just knows. Of course, it's the, it's the store down the, you know, and um, then you actually find the store Good luck trying to find it during opening hours because there is such a laid-back um, approach to um, uh, to opening hours, and that's true across. Um, you know, every time I go back to America, I am amazed that stores are opened on Sunday, um, you know, and open full hours on Saturday, and that the stores aren't taking a three-hour siesta every day in the afternoon and just closing at random times for no reason with no warning. That's what life is like. But that's the downside. The upside is. You know, while there's a certain laid-back attitude towards customer service and everything else, there's a laid-back attitude. I mean, that's a negative thing. It's an equally positive thing that there's a laid-back attitude for just life. The pace of life is slower. Things are more relaxed. Um, you know, Jen is, is so much more rested and peaceful as a person, as am I. I mean, it's really changed us, and for the better, I think. So, on the whole, we're very, very happy to be EU citizens living in the EU. But it's, it's a huge culture shock. And again, the, you know, your, pay, your, your quality of life will drop prodigiously. So, just know that going in. Alrighty, so that was Ben's question. Alrighty, and then last one, Jim asks, who do you feel are some of the most underrated game designers? Game designers who consistently put out good work but don't get the recognition or have the popularity you feel they deserve. Okay, 
I am not going to be able to BS my way through that answer and just say the first thing that comes to mind. I'm sorry, Jim. I should have done some research for that. Tell you what, Jim's question is going to be my first question in the Q&A section in next month's, and I will have actually done a little bit of research to actually have a few good answers for that. Let's see. Who... uh Nope, I can't even think of it. So, sorry, Jim. Yours, your question will be first up in podcast number three. And that's it, folks. That was it for questions and answers. You got any more? Questions at rotto.com. We'll try to cover them next month in between, um, you know, when I'm not doing my Gen Con 2015 preview. Okay, we're almost at the finish line. Just now, we got to go hit. We have to talk about engines, of all things. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Thanks for waiting on this. I had to get all my ducks in a row because, oh my gosh, even though it was only like five days ago that I put up my top 10 engine builder video, you know, and it's been seen by, I don't know, however many thousands of times it's been watched, but wow, I got a lot of feedback, a lot of people listing a lot of games about, you're crazy. What about XYZ? What were you thinking? This makes no sense. That's not an engine builder. This is an engine builder, you know, and, and so on. And Fair dues, it's it's fine. I mean, everybody's got their opinion. And it's I guess I'm not that surprised because really that's gonna come out with Engine Builder because, like I said in the video, Engine Builder is not in any way, shape, or form an officially recognized gameplay mechanism. It's not like worker placement or hand management or card drafting or you know, uh, you know uh, 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 a pickup and delivery or any number of other ones that while maybe there's some room for debate about some of the finer points of it. People, as a general rule, know what you're talking about. Engine Builder is this big, wide open, you know, undefined territory where everybody has to make it for themselves. And I realized after the fact, I was a total doom cough. And at no point in that video did I actually define this is what I call an engine builder. So I really should have opened with that, with the benefit of hindsight. So let me just get that out of the way right now. I mean, to me, it's really simple. If you're talking about a board game, a card game, whatever, an engine builder game means your primary focus has to be about creating an in-game construct, i.e. an engine, that will automate labor. And that's it. Uh, and so it was from that that I got my top 10. Although, actually, before I start talking about people's questions about X, Y, or Z, I, I should say another broad thing, which I also didn't mention in the video. you got to understand. I mean, it's, it's funny, actually. One person said, wow, Rado seems to be going really hipster with this, um, you know, because it, I guess because it seemed like I was you know, picking really kind of you know, esoteric games and whatnot, and I wasn't just picking all the big favorites. Why didn't I just hit all the top ones? Particularly because if you just go to, you know, http colon slash slash games.rado.com, you can see what my top 300 games are. And, you know, there are several engine builders, or what are widely considered to be engine builders, that are in my top 20, in my top 30, and they didn't make this list. So why is that? Well, just to be clear, um, when I make a top 10 list, maybe it's the designer in me, that I tend to look at games in, in a different point of view. If, if you want to ask me what are the best engine builders, I'm going to tell you what I think are the best games that do engine building. I'm not going to tell you what my personal favorites are, because you can see that. Again, just go to games.rado.com. You can see what all my favorites are in any category, in any theme, in any way you want. All that information is publicly available. That is not an interesting list. That is not a top 10 list that informs anybody about the subject matter. It informs people about me. And that information is readily available. So I, when I do a top 10, I'm not going to just do, hey, these are my personal favorites. I'm going to do the, the t games, the 10 games that I think best leverage Whatever it would be, a theme, a mechanism, a, uh, a style of play, you know, whatever. And so uh, that's why, but that's one of the reasons that many, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, engine builders did not make the list. Not because I don't love these games. It's just like people were, um, you know, really taken aback when I did my top 10 worker placement games and I didn't list Agricola amongst them, even though Agricola is my favorite game of all time. And yet, how could I not put it on the list? It's because Agricola is my favorite game of all time, but not because of the worker placement. The worker placement in that game is just kind of so-so. It's just average. There's nothing really great about it. There are so many games that do worker placement so much better than Agricola. What makes Agricola special is the, is the cards. 
which I don't know what you'd call a hand management. Not really quite. It's the long-term strategic um, planning that's in that game. That's what makes that game so amazing, not the worker placement. And by the same token, well, actually, let's just start talking about some of these games that people had suggested or asked about. That's what we're going to go through. Let's see. Uh, you know, again, um, I'm, I'm not actually going to go through my list in case you haven't heard my list. And, you know, I don't want to do any spoilers. But you know, I listed ten, and then Jen got on camera or off camera. She was just off camera. She listed four as well. But I'm not going to talk about those fourteen. Well, actually, I'm going to talk about one of them. Uh, I'm going to talk about all the other stuff people asked about. So let's get going. And then this is in no particular order. This is people asking stuff on Board Game Geek, on YouTube, on Reddit. Some people, you know, messaged me directly um, on Twitter, all over the place. And so I, I just collected a big list of what about Game X, and I'm just going to go through this list. Starting with, okay, I'm going to be a bit cheesy about the first one I'm going to mention, Lewis and Clark. A lot of people were very disappointed I didn't mention this. And I'll be honest, this is the only time I'm going to do this. Um, you know, all the other ones I have a good reason for, the only reason Lewis and Clark didn't make the list is because it's my number 11. It was so close. And I thought about it long and hard. And, and I mean, actually, I went back and watched my old video of Lewis and Clark to kind of jog my memory about my feelings about it and stuff like that. Because to be fair, I haven't actually played it probably for six months. I played the new Lewis and Clark dice game more recently than Lewis and Clark, the base game. But... Um, the it it it's it's no fault of Lewis and Clark's. It is a brilliant. It so deserves to be on the list. If I was making a top eleven, I would have made it. There were just ten engines that I thought did something a bit more interesting, a bit more out of the box, a bit more fresh, a bit more new, a bit more exciting. But to be fair, Lewis and Clark's engine building is so wonderful because it's you know the, the whole thing is right there in your hand. You do build it. You build a hand, and there's none of the stuff that happens in Dominion where it's really kind of out of your control. You're in total control of that game, and it's a very flexible, responsive engine. Uh, in the way you can use it, you can use the cards for multiple things. It's a lovely, brilliant game. It just missed it by that much. So, uh, honorable mention goes to Lewis and Clark. And, you know, quite frankly, I should have mentioned that in the video. Let's see. Now, another one that's easy to kind of dismiss, uh, some people asked about, or one guy asked about Steampunk Rally, which is a brilliant game. And the reason I didn't even consider it is because it doesn't exist yet. It has not been published. It's, uh, I, I did a run-through for the prototype of it. I think it's a brilliant engine builder. If it was in the retail channel, I might have seriously considered it. I don't know if it would have made it, but I would have seriously considered it. Uh, Steampunk Rally. But now, let's get on to some favorites that didn't make the list and why. Let's see. It's uh, actually, like St. Pete. Or St. Petersburg. I would call it St. Pete. Imperial Settlers. Splendor. These are three games that... Um, well, Splendor's kind of iffy. Splendor's kind of hard, but I'll go with it. I'll, I'll, I'll say that that is, an, you know, that is an engine builder because you do you build a tableau that does prevent, you know, it, it, it automates labor. I don't have to collect gems because all the gems are automatically being generated by this. So I'll give it that. I'll, I'll call it an engine builder. No problem. I know a lot of people would argue it's not an engine builder. It's like some kind of escalation gameplay, but we'll call it an engine builder. Why was Splendor and St. Petersburg and Imperial Settlers not on the list? They're great games, all three of them. In fact, actually, I've recently played Imperial Settlers, which is a whole other story. Oh, I should have mentioned that in my um, games I played recently, because I played Imperial Settlers at... Oh, well, nah, I'll worry about that some other time. This has already gone on way too long. Why did these three wonderful engine builders not make my list? Quite frankly, for the same reason Agricola did not make my top 10 worker placement games. They're great games. They do great worker place... or, or you know, in, you know, engine building, but... They're just kind of vanilla. They just do it. You, you build an engine, you use it, but there's nothing cool or special. Uh, you know, the engine building in these games is not what makes them cool. Um, you know, it's, it's there. It, it is a fundamental part of the game. But it's it's not what I walk away from saying, wow, I, I really feel proud of the engine I built in that game. I mean, St. Petersburg, it's practically non-existent. I mean, you know, it's just a, every round, it's, it's, it's a means that you get for you know collecting resources at the beginning. And then the whole game, the lion's share of the game is really about what do you do with those resources that your engine built. And the, the building of the engine itself is a minor part. Um, Imperial Settlers is a bit better because you know you are trying to um, you know build cards that will synergize well together that will you know lead from you know leapfrog from one to the next to the next. So it's pretty nice. And it's a, it's a great game. It's really really cool. It turns out it is too mean, as I had long suspected. And people said, no, it's not too mean. Yeah, it is. But we'll have to talk about that another day. But still, while while it's it's good and it's satisfying and it rocks, it's just kind of 
standard. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing that makes me say, wow, they really reinvented engine building. They really brought something new to the fore. And for that reason, I, I can't consider it one of the 10 best engine builders, even though it's a really great game. Splendor, um, again, same thing. You, you make a strong engine, but it just kind of sits there. It just generates stuff right in the background. It, it, it's not alive. It's, it's not interesting. It's, it's, it's solid. It works. But the, honestly, those three games, I would say the engine building in St. Petersburg, Imperial Settlers, and Splendor is good, solid, workman quality, but it's a little vanilla. It's, it's not special. Um, there's other reasons those games are special. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the engine building. So that's why those ones don't make it. Um, okay, and then I, I, I can't uh, delay. I did talk a bit about deck builders in this in the video itself, but I, I you know people kept bringing it up. Um, you know, uh, and uh, so I guess I got to talk about it a bit more. Why isn't Dominion on the list? Why isn't Eminent Domain or Eminent Domain Microcosm or Core Worlds or any number of deck builders? Why are they not on the list? Well, okay. Basically, here's the thing. If I get back to my definition of what is an engine builder, or, you know, if I'm going to build an engine in a game, you know, it, it, it has to be a construct that automates labor. Does a deck builder do that? Yes, it does because you know I, I build this deck and it automates labor. It starts generating stuff for me every turn. But here's the thing. I guess I'd have to add a caveat to what's an engine builder for me, um, because a crappy engine is not an engine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and in fact, this actually came up uh, in one of the YouTube threads. Somebody pointed out when they were describing me versus Jen as, an, as the actual builder of an engine. Me, I, you know, if you look at all my choices from the top 10, you would have to consider me kind of like a precision engineer. This is not my words. Uh, this is somebody else's really smart observation, I thought. You know, I'm kind of a precision engineer. I want control over what I'm building. I want to make the perfect engine to do the job I want it to do. You're not doing that when you're making an engine in Dominion or you know any other deck builder. In that game, you're not a precision engineer. You're a mad scientist. Because what you're trying to create is an experiment. You are hodgepodging together all these cards. And don't get me wrong. You're doing it with a goal in mind. But you have no guarantee that that engine is going to produce what you want. That engine is going to do whatever the hell it wants within the realm of you know, probabil you know, probabilistic determination and stuff like that. And so... I don't believe you're building an engine in Dominion. You are building an experiment. You are building, you're a mad scientist, creating an experiment, and then seeing every turn, what is my experimental thing? You've made an experimental prototype of an engine, but you have no idea what's going to put out. And an experimental prototype does not fit my bill for an engine, because an engine has to automate labor. And a lot of the time, an experimental prototype will fail to do that. Sometimes it'll do it, and a lot of times it won't. Now, uh, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. I can't think of a better way to put it, and I'm sure a lot of people will still disagree. You can make the argument that by the end of Dominion, at the, at the end of the game, right when it's about to finish, and um, you know, you, you've, you've put the cards in the deck, you've thinned the deck out, you, might have, you could make the argument that maybe by the end of the game, you have finally gone from crazy, wild, experimental prototype of an engine to an actual engine. But you know what? The game is over by that point. And you spent the lion's share of the game not building an engine, but building a prototype of an engine. And so that's why it doesn't fit. That's why it did, I, they did not go onto the list for me. For me to feel like I'm actually building an engine, I have to be in control. It has to be able to adhere to strict regulations. It has to be predictable in what it will produce. Because otherwise, it's not automating labor. Um, and so that's what it comes down to for me. That's why your eminent domain's your ascensions, your whatever it might be, they don't. Your dominions, your thunderstones, they did not make it onto my top ten engine building be, for that reason. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of people are saying, "Rado, you're an idiot," and I apologize. You know, again, I'm going to say that comes back to the fundamental flaw of trying to have a top 10 engine builder anyway, because I had so many people ask about so many games that to me were so blatantly not even remotely engine builders. And um, you know, there were several people who commented, how could you even say that's an engine builder? That has absolutely nothing to do with engine building. And that's because it's an almost completely useless game term. But still, I was happy to do it. It was a fun exercise. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Other games. Um, people asked about... Orléans 
and La Havre and Manhattan Project and um, Progress. What's the full name of Progress? The Evolution of Technology and Twa. Twa is especially interesting because Jen brought up Twa. And so what about those? Why aren't those engine builders? I mean, and particularly because you know, Twa is in my top 10 games of all times. Why did La Havre is, a, is an amazing game. Or Leon make one of my, is, you know, I think it's in my top 20 or my top 30. Clearly you love these games. Why did they not make the list? And I'm going to go back to my original definition of an engine builder. You are, you're having to build a construct i.e. the engine, and it has to automate labor. Now, all of those games, you are building something. No two ways about it. You're building effectively a tableau um, in La Havre. You're getting all these different buildings out in front of you. And the same thing for Progress. You know, a Manhattan Project, you're building all these different buildings and labs and stuff. And, um, you know, um, Twa, you're building, but it's not a bunch of cars in front of you. It's a bunch of, you're building this a network of apprentices all over the place. And so all of these things let you build something, but none of them automate labor because they don't run on their own. In all of these games, nothing is ever going to happen unless you personally take the time to make them go. Um, and so, to me, a worker placement game, by definition, cannot be an engine building game. You've built a worker, you, you've built a, a job network for your workers, but you haven't built an engine because an engine means the workers don't have to work anymore. But in Lahav, nothing's going to happen unless you send your worker out somewhere in this network of jobs you've created. So, to me, that's why those games fundamentally do not fit the definition of an engine builder. But I know for a lot of people, they do. But again, that just comes back to you know the very broad definition of what an engine builder is. So I can only answer by saying they don't fit my definition. Okay, and then there are a few more. And these were other ones that were very commonly pointed out. Why were these overlooked? Race for the Galaxy, San Juan, Agricola, Isle, Isle of Trains, or I Love Trains, um, Roll for the Galaxy. And there were a few other ones along these lines, but these were the big ones. Why? Where were those? Where was the love for Tom Lehman? Come on! Um, I will grant every single one of those things is an engine builder. Um, you know, by my definition, there are means you can use in the game to, you can take steps to set up an engine that will automate stuff. Will automate the generation of goods. You know, an Agricola will will feed your family automatically. Um, you know, Isle of Trains, you know, which you know is not really pick up deliver. A lot of people think it's that, but you know, it's it's kind of an engine builder too. And your your engine, literally your train engine, your choo choo engine. Um, you know, uh, but here's the thing. None of them made it. I mean, and they're all good engine builders as well. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the elements of them work. You know, like the vanilla ones up top, they do a good job. But um, not only are all of these games pretty straightforward, there's, there's nothing really special or cool or unique about their engine building. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, Agricola's engine building is pretty cool. I, I, you know, I'll even go so far as to say, yeah, they are very cool. The problem is, all of those didn't make my list because the engine building is only a small part of the game. And in fact, you could go the entire game without engaging in engine building at all. They are engine building adjacent. They are not, in fact, engine building games. They are different things. They are hand management games. They are tableau building games. They are worker placement games. They are not. In, they are. They are games that have a small portion of engine building on top, and therefore they cannot be considered engine building games. For it to be an engine building game, the primary thing of that game has to be all about engine building. Um, so, like you know, people said, what fleet. Oops, I, I just did a spoiler. Fleet made your top 10, but, but Race for the Galaxy didn't? That's insane. How could that be? Um, well, don't get me wrong. I, I, I think Fleet's great. I think Race for the Galaxy, I mean, it's probably, it's, I believe it's higher on my overall list, so it's, it's, more, it's my more favorite game. But, um, you know, Race for the Galaxy, you know what? Your engine will run once every once in a while, but you spent all of your effort in Fleet is bent on building that engine, maintaining that engine, um, supporting and nurturing that engine so that it can deliver for you turn after turn after turn. Not only its raw resources, but all kinds of cool special powers. And it all comes back to that engine. In Race for the Galaxy, you know what? You might win the game without ever once producing anything on any planet. Ever. Um, you know, and you can say, oh yeah, well then you're going to make a military engine instead. But if you're if you call the military engine of Race for the Galaxy an engine, then it's it's uh, it, you know the the military engine of Race for the Galaxy doesn't automate labor very much. It doesn't work on its own. You have to make it go. Um, you, you, you know, uh, if there were, you know, it gets back to like 
Manhattan Project, uh, another one people off. You know, I, I set up all these cards. There's all these great combos here, but the engine will never go unless I put a worker on it and I send my worker. Therefore, the work was not automated. So that's why those ones predominantly, like I said, because while there's engine building in them, and it's great engine building, maybe even you know um, revolutionary engine building, it's not very much. It's a, it's a subset of the game, and therefore it can't be an engine building game. And let's see. And then also, somebody asked about Through the Ages, and to be honest, I never even considered it because it's been so long since I played. I don't remember. Is it an engine building game? I'm not really quite sure, but I just figured I'd throw that one in too. So that's it, folks. And actually, that went fairly quickly. What are we at? Oh, that was only like six minutes. Oh, that's pretty good. Phew. Okay, after all my endless blather, we can finally bring this second Rotto Talks Through podcast to a close. Let me know what you think, folks. Um, I'm sure people will have a few comments about my new transition style. I think it's kind of fun. I hope you guys like it. Uh, but, you know, whatever. Maybe we'll try something else next month if enough people uh, bring the shade, as it were. But I think I'm going to end it right there. Remember, once again, next month, or actually it'll be this month because this is coming out a bit late, we'll be doing a Gen Con preview. That'll be probably the lion's share of the podcast is so you can listen to it while you're on your long drive to Indianapolis or on your plane ride or whatever so you can know what I am so jealous about because you get to go and I don't. So that'll be coming in 20, 25 days or so. I'd have to look at a calendar. So listen for that soon. And otherwise, as always, folks, thanks for listening. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.